Okay, uh, starting on meeting call to order. Now I request our CGP secretary, Dr. Anand sir, to give to say IMA prayer and efficient prayer. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sandil. Uh, IMA prayer. May everybody be happy. May everybody be healthy. May everybody be free from pain. May everybody be free from sorrow. May we be the healing cure beyond every greed and lure. Physician prayer. Physician's prayer. Dear Lord, thou great physician, I kneel before thee, since every good and perfect gift must come from thee. I pray, give skill to my hands, clear vision to my mind, kindness and sympathy to my heart, give singleness of purpose, strength to life, at least a part of the burden of my suffering fellow men, and a true realization of the rare privilege that is mine. Take from my heart all guile and worldliness, that is, with the simple faith of a child, I rely on thee. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So now I will be giving my welcome address. So first of all, I will thank our IMA Tamil Nadu State President, Secretary, sir, and all our office bearers for joining in this wonderful gathering. So now I welcome our State President, Abulasan, sir, our State Secretary, Karthik Prabhu, sir, and also our uh, immediate past president, Sendhamal Pari, sir, President-elect Sengutuan, sir, and uh, Dr. Sridhar, sir. And uh, we have felicitations to be done by our Dean C CGP Headquarters, Dr. Sachyadit Bora, sir, and uh, Dr. Jailal, sir, our immediate, our past national president and secretary, Commonwealth Association. So we welcome you all, sir. And also I welcome all our eminent speakers for the day, Dr. Nemanajan, sir, Dr. Raghunandan, sir, and Suresh Kumar, sir, for this wonderful CME. We have a huge gathering and we have a wonderful academic feast ahead. And I request all our members to stay tuned throughout the session and also to ensure to get our credit hours. I request all our members to just put your registration number alone in the chat box. Need not type your entire name, mail ID, and mobile number. Thank you. Now, over to you, sir. Anand, sir. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Sandil. Uh, now, I request uh, our state president, Dr. Abdul Hassan, sir, to give his presidential address. Uh, thank you, Anand. Uh, thank you. Colleagues in uh, CGP, Dr. Sandil. Dr. Vivek and Dr. Gobalakrishnan, and uh, welcome my dear uh, friend, uh, Dr. Sachajit Bora, Dean IMA, CGP, and Dr. Sengutuan, President-elect, uh, Dr. Kathik Prabhu, Under Secretary, IMA TNSB, and uh, Dr. Jailal, uh, past national president, and uh, Dr. Sridhar, President-elect, and all my uh, all the speakers of today, Dr. Naminathan Raghunandan and Dr. Suresh Kumar. 
uh, it has been an amazing uh, kind of uh, work by IMACGP in Tamil Nadu state. I really congratulate the team for, for keeping the IMACGP flag flight uh, from the start, from the time you took over as office bearers. And uh, we have been witnessing that a huge gathering, huge number of delegates for every uh, CME uh, on Zoom is organized by IMACGP and is gaining momentum and is always well appreciated. Uh, in this way, this, today's seminar also is a very, very informative one. I'm sure all the delegates who joined today will be immensely benefited by the talk, uh, by the topic that is a fever update. As usual, our uh, friendly and eminent faculties, Dr. Uh, Neminathan, Raghunandan, Suresh Kumar, who have been with us in our, all of our ventures uh, in, the, in the CME, and they have been taking part in all the programs and updating our knowledge of our delegates. Uh, similarly, I wish uh, uh, the branch chapters of CGP also should be completed in all the branches, and also the membership also to be, uh, membership growth also to be uh, addressed. And I wish all the uh, talks given today uh, will be uh, converted into YouTube talks and uh, it can be circulated to all the delegates and all the members with a link so that all people will be immensely benefited. I want to congratulate the team of IMSCGP Tamil Nadu State and all those, all the speakers also uh, for taking part in this today's CME. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Over to you, Dr. Anand. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your kind words, sir. We have been trying to improve the membership and also the people who are joining the courses, sir. We'll try to do so also, sir. Thank you for your kind words, sir. Now, we request our State Secretary, Dr. Karthik Prabhu, sir, to give his address, Secretary's address. Karthik, sir. Thank, thank you, Anand, sir. Most respected President, all the leaders of IMA and CGP uh, scheme, Chairman, Secretary, and everybody, speak, dear speakers, uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate the CGP team because this fellowship in infectious diseases is one of the most important and need of the hour, which our members, especially IBM members, need to be updated on. Second thing, sir, recently there is a lot of policy changes in the government where the joint director, especially in our part, there are a lot of dengue deaths happening. So all the infectious disease, they have to, the reporting format has been very stringently stressed upon and the treatment, especially the guidelines for treatment for fever is now very important because any death and the case sheets are found that inadvertent use of antibiotics, no, ploid, no proper fluid management is going to be a disaster. So, rightly so, the topics you have chosen for the day is also fever both in OP and IP setup, acute febrile illness in adults and prolonged unknown origin fever. Are wonderful topics. So, beautifully selected and best wishes, I'm sure. There will be a lot of people who take up this course because infectious disease is going to be the bread and butter for the general practitioners and uh, rightly you made this for inauguration. Best wishes, Anand sir and Sindhil sir and the entire team. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Karthik Prabhu sir, for your kind words. And as you said, uh, because uh, in your part of the uh, district, you have the stringent, stringent guidelines. You have, we have the speaker, uh, the star speaker, one of the star speakers, Umnevin and sir, who came through. And moreover, uh, Professor Raghunandan, sir, who is none other than the Professor of MMC, will guide us in the government guidelines on policies also. So it will be of very great, great help for the general practitioners. Thank you, Kathik, sir. Uh, now, I, um, uh, now I'd like to give my address uh, as, uh, as part of the uh, gathering today. So I would like to uh, welcome uh, our President, sir, our Secretary, sir, our uh, President-elect, uh, our past President, uh, and our uh, president elect Sridhar, sir, also. And particularly our Dean uh, Bora sir and uh, Jalal sir for this gathering. Uh, oh. Very kind of you to have a spare time for attending us, sir. So uh, today's uh, main uh, thing is uh, we are uh, conducting the CME and also inaugurating the fellowship courses for which already we have more than uh, seven enrollments. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe at the end of the CME today, I think we will get more uh, numbers in enrollment. Uh, sir, Neminan sir has a plan to... Uh, deliver a talk on uh, about the courses also a short lecture is also is arranged uh, so apart from that uh, we have been trying to start uh, sub chapters of uh, 
uh, CGP and all the state branches where there are more than 20 members. Uh, two branches have been already started, one in Ramnagaram and another in Namakal. Uh, and we are also planning to start uh, two more new courses, uh, which is in the pipeline. Uh, shortly, we'll be doing it. One is on emergency medicine, and the other thing is the need of the our uh, the uh, geriatric medicine, sir. We are working on the courses. Uh, so hopefully, we'll come up with the course shortly. And uh, we also request uh, all the participants who are participating to uh, take a look at all those courses and uh, take time to spare time to attend it and update the knowledge. Uh, so uh, thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity, sir. Uh, now I request our uh, uh, chief guest uh, of the day, Bora, sir. Uh, sir, are you online, sir? Yeah, yes, uh, yes. Yes, sir. Uh, sir can, you, uh, can you give a felicitation to us, sir? A warm welcome on okay. behalf of IAM in Tamil Nadu CGP, sir. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, respected our past national president and the patron of CGP, Dr. Jayalal, sir. Uh, state President of Tamil Nadu, Dr. Abu Hassan, uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Kartik Prabhu, the State Secretary, and Santil Kumar, the Director of Studies of the State Faculty Tamil Nadu, as well as the Joint Secretary of IMS CGP Headquarters, and Dr. Anand, the State uh, CGP Secretary, and all other dignitaries, all other state leaders, and also uh, the other participate, participants in the today's program. So it is very uh, heartening to know that uh, IMA CGP uh, Tamil Nadu State Faculty has been arranged, organizing so many fellowships programs, and this is really attracting the general practitioners and the family physicians to the fold of IMA CGP. And uh, infectious disease is definitely one of the very important aspects. And as we have already said, that fever is, uh, I, I feel fever is very interesting, as well as very confusing also. And it is probably one of the main region for the antibiotic misuse, not only in the uh, periphery region by the uh, periphery areas by the general practitioner or the family physician, but more so by the experts and the senior specialists also. And also patients are um, advised to right and left investigations, including for malaria, typhoid, jaundice, cancer sensitivity, and whatnot. I, I, don't, I don't think that uh, the particular pattern of fever is missing these days. So I think all these aspects will be discussed today, and our uh, participants will be benefited enormously, and they'll, be go, they'll go back to their practice with more enriching knowledge on fever, and, they'll be, and the patients will get more justice as far as the fever is concerned, and avoiding lots of investigations and also minimizing the uh, pres number of drugs in the prescription. And uh, I'm also very happy to know that the uh, Tamil Nadu State Faculty is contemplating two other very important courses on emergency medicine and geriatric medicine. I think not only from Tamil Nadu, but from all the country, the general practitioners will get interest to get enrolled in these courses. I wish you all the best. And thank you very much again for giving me the opportunity to come to this uh, meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bora, sir. With your, with your permission, I think I can announce it here, sir. There's a lot of... Uh, in April, we have, uh, I think you can announce it yourself, so it will be of help for it. In April, okay. we are planning to connect the uh, zonal conference here in Tamil Nadu, so you can. Okay, uh, that, yeah, yesterday I came to know about this, and that will very much, I'll be there personally, if I get an invitation, surely I'll be there. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, thank you for your kind words, sir. We'll try to contemplate and uh, we'll try to increase our courses, which is very useful for uh, general practitioners, sir. We'll try to do it, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, now I request Professor Jailal, sir, past National President IMA headquarters to give his felicitations. Jailal, sir. Thank you, Anand. And uh, thank you, uh, Lord Satyajit Bora, Sindhil, and uh, the leaders, Abul Hassan and uh, our uh, Kartik and other members and the thank faculties you. today. It is indeed always a privilege for me to be a part of uh, any IMA CGP program. Uh, because it was one field, one area what I firmly believe can do a tremendous job, not only for the updating the knowledge of our doctors, but also in turn serve the community and society because the benefit will go to the people who are coming to the doctor for getting treatment. And I'm so happy that you are organizing this program on a most important topic of the uh, fever and the infectious diseases, which is one of the more major a challenging problem when it comes as a pyrexia of unknown origin or the fever coming into the pediatric age group. I think I'm sure that the people who will attend this program will get benefited with the expert here, Renee Nathan, one of the uh, uh, renowned stalwarts in the infectious disease area. And similarly, Professor Raghunandan, and all of this will be given to give a lot of benefit. 
One area which I'm much concerned about is that uh, antimicrobial resistance, which is mounting today, and MASIC region being unnecessary or uh, non uh, the rational use of the antibiotic, and or in the other words, we can say the irrational use of antibiotic. I'm sure if at all the one major impact which we are going to uh, get from this training today on talking about the infectious disease will be a stopping of this unnecessary use of uh, uh, antibiotics for just patient coming for the fever and patient coming for a problem with that and without diagnosing it properly. Because we are in a very pathetic situation regarding this AMR because the number of new drugs or new molecules coming to us are very minimal. And in our own eyes in front of us, 13 to 14 percent of the people are developing resistant to malaria, uh, the drugs which we are having. Tuberculosis, almost 14 to 15 percentage of people are gone. I mean, it is a, a stage where we are not able to treat. And that all put us in a very, very, very uh, painful situation. Remember, like what we read in the, the novels in the olden days, when somebody has a pneumonia, they will die because there was no drug. And similar situation is slowly repeat back because of various reasons, irrational use of antibiotic by our own people, irrational use of antibiotic by the unqualified quacks, Irrational use of antibiotic in uh, including the honey, animal husbandry, and everywhere. So we need to, because IMA as such, the headquarters IMA is taking up very painful or very uh, very uh, characteristic steps to prevent this AMR, uh, antimicrobial resistance, and do something. And uh, I'm so happy IMA Tamil Nadu, the CGP is taking up that. And you are going to talk to us on the fever, I mean, infectious diseases, and how best we'll be able to treat and uh, very, very few percentage of your normal fever may need an antibiotic. So that will be a great help. So once again, I thank the IMA CGP, especially Tamil Nadu unit. Both Dr. Sindhil and the new Dr. I mean, Anand are doing excellent job. I'm so happy to see that so much of people are joining the CME program. I think I, I wish CGP is always a national program, national event. So even oh. though the IMA Tamil Nadu is organizing it, uh, I, I wish under the, yes. the presence of the Satyajit Bora and uh, other leaders, it should have a national yeah. implication yeah. and national color. And that will always bring a lot of uh, hope to the uh, people. Because today, oh, with the internet yeah. era, the boundaries are cut short. I think Neminathan and Raghunandan uh, you want are to join the, the meeting? people of Tamil Nadu. They are the people of, uh, of international caliber and they, their voice should reach out to all corners of India. Thank you, Anand. Thank you, Sandil, for a wonderful job. Keep it up. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you for a very kind and enlightening word, sir. So we'd like to keep, keep up, up to your expectations, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Now, I request our uh, president, state president-elect, uh, Dr. Sengu Dhan, sir, to give his felicitations. Good evening to everybody. Respected president, Dr. Abu, Abu Lawson, Secretary Karthik Prabhu, National past national president Dr. Jayalal and other leaders of the forum. It is really fortunate to have this topic fever update during this period. It will enlighten the delegates who is participating in this program, will have the full knowledge about the fever update. Dr. Naimanathan, known neon, eminent neonatologist and known international figure. In this uh, neonatal fever update infectious disease, he will update all the in, in, instructions to be followed in this matter. So I, I once again congratulate Dr. Anand and Chandil Kumar for this wonderful program going to be uh, enlightened today. Thank you very much for the opportunity given Anand and Chandil. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Sridhar, sir, can you give a, say a few words regarding our uh, CGP on this uh, event, sir? Okay. Sir, I think Sridhar, sir, has not come, sir. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, sir, okay. I request our uh, finance, state finance secretary, Dr. Gauri, sir, to okay. say a few words. Uh, most respect, President, sir. Uh, our uh, Honorary Secretary, Dr. Karthik Prabhu, sir, <coughs> uh, Jailal, sir, our uh, Commonwealth uh, Secretary, sir, uh, the persons, two persons who are doing a wonderful and marvelous job, Dr. Sandil Kumar, CGP Chairman, and uh, Anand Chaplikam, Secretary of the CGP Wings. 
so they are doing very well for the previous program so 70 people have joined for the uh, fellowship uh, course and now uh, the second infectious disease is also going and will started very well so you have <clears throat> selected the most eminent speakers um uh, everyone knows about dr namrathan sir um uh, he is uh, used to come to all places to give this infectious uh, disease speech now it's uh, spreading all over india so i think people make use of this and also other two eminent speakers dr raghunandan sir and suresh kumar sir so i think everyone has spoken about you so its uh, job is very well being uh, done and it's going on congratulations to the ongoing team best wishes sir do well sir thank you for the opportunity thank you dr gaurishankar sir for your kind words uh sendil can we yes, uh, move on to the next yes sir sir now uh, yes. Uh, having mm-hmm. finishing all our uh, felicitations and other things like uh, now we like to inaugurate our uh, state president and uh, secretary to uh, jointly inaugurate the fellowship course in infectious disease abul sir kartik sir yes sir sir we just uh, want you to officially inaugurate the yes sir we are very very course, happy yes. to inaugurate this infectious disease course from our state sir on behalf of president and myself best wishes sir we, thank you we, thank you dr uh, hope this sir. journey is very successful to cgp thank you yes, thank sir. you very much thank sir you, thank you sir thank you sir yes sir and uh, now uh, i request dr uh, neminathan sir sir the uh, next two hours is yours sir so you can take care of her and you can just start your presentation sir and enlighten us about this fever sir name land sir hello name land sir okay. and uh, meanwhile uh, we request our all our members to stay throughout the session and uh, we have our uh, tnmc observers also in the session so yeah. yes sir uh, good sir, evening everyone in the session uh, sir yes sir good evening everyone at the outset i like to thank our dynamic leader dr abul hasan sir perfectionist dr kartik mm-hmm. prabhu sir and a role model dr jailal sir true leader dr sangutuvan sir and a motivational dr satyajit sir and a most friendly leaders dr sendil dr anand dr gauri shankar uh, with this introduction friends today we have uh, nearly more than 650 doctors attending this cme my appreciations to the entire cgp team sendil and dr anand uh, for beginning a big gathering so with that let us jump to the academics friends today we have uh, three eminent speakers along with me dr raghunandan sir a professor of medicine from madras medical college dr suresh kumar who is an id consultant and uh, uh, our team infectious disease team is headed by none other than dr kulande sami sir the former director of public health of tamil nadu and also we are ably assisted by dr mohan kumar sir he is a infectious disease epidemiologist from cdc atlanta and also we got dr suri kumar Uh, head of the department uh, hod of microbiology department dindigal medical college so we six of us at this team and then we proudly like to launch the fourth batch of infectious disease certificate course from april 14 those doctors who are willing to join this course can contact our team immediately after the end of the meeting so it be the most important certificate that you will be having not only for the sake of certificate for the really improvement of your practice is going to be infectious disease certificate because i am sure you will all agree with me vast majority of our uh, practice is infections that is nearly 80% of our opd practice is infections so this uh, your knowledge on infection is going to save not only the patient is going to save the your practice also so this uh, today cme is going to be a highly interactive seminar it is going to be a clinical case based seminar so i request everybody whenever i ask for a question any i ask you to please put your answer in the chat box so the moment you uh, put your answer in the chat box i'll be screening the chat box and then we'll go to the next slide so it is going to be interactive it is not going to be a monologue it is going to be dialogue it is interactive between all the 650 audience and myself 
So we are going to have an objective of simple practical evidence-based management strategies in fevers. Uh, those practitioners, including general practitioners, pediatricians, and others in the peripheries are going to be the beneficiaries with that introduction. Friends, I'm sure you will all agree with me. Fever is a controlled rise of temperature, which is regulated by the thermosensitive cells in the hypothalamus. Please remember, it is not a disease per se. It is a manifestation of underlying disease. Somebody has got fever. You should not chase the fever. You have to find out the cause of fever and treat the cause of fever. Friends, I'm sure at this point of time, I like to once again emphasize, fever is a friend. It's a protective defense mechanism. Do not over treat a fever. You need to find out the cause of fever and treat the fever. That's the most important message. With that, I'm going to tell you a simple five-point rule that you need to apply in your day-to-day -day practice. Whenever you see a child that comes to your OPD for a fever, short fever of two days or three days, the first thing you need to know is whether the, what is the empirical diagnosis. Empirical diagnosis consists of four components. One is anatomical component, another is the etiological component, third is the pathological component, fourth is the function component. For example, one mother one day, one day, one day, white ala podhum, doctor, tani taniya podhum di nana. So, the anatomy is in the intestines, etiology is rotavirus, pathology is enteritis, and the functional is dehydration and dyslexia. So, this is how you arrive at an empirical diagnosis. To arrive at an empirical diagnosis in fever, you need to apply a simple five-point rule. If you apply this rule, you will be correct 100% of the time your antibiotic prescription will come down to less than 9% in your day-to-day -day practice. If you see 100 children with fever, just by applying this rule, your antibiotic prescription will come to only 9%. 91% will go back just with the paracetamol without antibiotics. So what is this five-point rule? This is a very secret rule, which is not given in textbook, which I'm sure that I request all the participants who are in this audience to take care of. You can take a notes or you can at the end of the meeting, I'll display my cell number. You can send a request to me. I'll send you the whole slides. So you can keep it in your table and then you can read it once again whenever you have leisure time. Point number one, sudden onset of high grade fever in a previously healthy child means it is viral fever. You can ask me why not bacteria? Bacteria has got a long incubation period. So viruses, ultra short incubation period. So fever within two hours. So that is a viral fever. More than one member in the family having fever at a given time is viral fever. For example, if they say, Neat fever sir, more than one member is viral because of ultra short incubation period. Within few hours to few days. Whereas bacteria, typhoid in sir. Pathanolic pneumonia and the bacteria has got long incubation period. Viruses ultra short incubation period. That's why you get this pandemic. When you look at go back to the history in 2009, swine flu pandemic one day, May the Ingle Lady came Mexico on the same. On the 28 days, and nearly 162 countries on this chair. So rapid. So viruses has got propensity to cause pandemic, epidemic. Whereas bacteria only localize illnesses. Okay. When multiple sites are involved, if you look at the child, the mother sitting, child sitting on the mother's lap, the eye is red, nose is watery, throat is congested. If multiple sites are involved, there is a dissemination, probably this virus. Whereas in bacteria, only one site will be involved. There'll be a bacterial lymphadenitis, swelling in the neck, separative node in the neck, or there can be bacterial tonsillopharyngitis, pus in the tonsils or there can be bacterial conjunctivitis. Only one site will be involved. Whereas in viruses, because of dissemination, multiple sites will be involved. Another important point is, if the mother says that uh, the child has got cough, watery diarrhea, skin rash, more than one system is involved. On auscultation, child has got bronchi with a watery diarrhea, skin rash, more than three systems, it is virus. Whereas bacteria localizes to only one system, bacterial pneumonia, bacterial dysentery, 
bacterial UTA. Only one system is involved, it's bacteria. Multiple systems involved in the given child, it is virus. In other words, the moment Amma and the mother told the Enama Pandan Katina, she will give a verbal diarrhea. Kanala Savandar King, Doctor Mukla Tanya, the Tola Piki, the Adipar, Irmi Tail, the Vaitala Pudu, Vandi Verde, Sapra Mandi, the Pola the Nine Nine Alitair, Kanala, or Mukla Tanima, the Ulitair, multiple symptoms. So when there is a verbal diarrhea on the mother, it is always it's a virus. She says only one complaint, it is probably bacteria. So with all these things, after giving paracetamol, the, when the fever touches normal, the child starts jumping about playing active. If the child is active during the interfebrile period, it swings the pendulum towards virus. Whereas in bacterial illnesses, for example, in typhoid or pneumonia, fever will come down, but the child will still be grunting, listening, child be uh, hypoxemic. All those things will be there in bacterial illnesses. Whereas in viral fever, in between two fevers, Kailia pedicamudia. That's interfebrile period. If all these five are positive, you are probably dealing with a short pyrex illness, fever of less than seven days, without any localizing signs, probably multi system involvement, most probably viral. And the most important thing you need to look at is does the child have any danger signs? I'll tell you what are the danger signs you need to see in the later part of the slide. With this, what your prescription should contain is only paracetamol and only co-prescription is paracetamol along with paracetamol is ORS. Put your signature, date, time, register number, everything in the black and white paper. This will save you in the court of law. So documentation is very, very important. And please remember, as I told you from the beginning, more than 91% of the time, these children with simple fever, febrile illnesses, or caused by viruses, and they do not require antibiotics. Sadhana kachal tamma bai prada virus kachal in the amoxil in mutu moonali kurudan dai sinjin the tapa pani radam. Never prescribe antibiotic for amoxil uh, for uh, viral fevers. So from today you have to make sure when you put a diagnosis of viral fever, write only paracetamol and ORS. Educate them about danger signs. Send them home without antibiotics. That will that will revolutionize, revolutionize our practice. And I'm sure all the practitioners in our country, in the entire country, will become, uh, will follow antibiotic stewardship. And we need to uh, reduce our antibiotic, unnecessary antibiotic prescription. We need to uh, protect our country against antibiotic resistance. So, having seen this, friends, now, Let's see what are the fever in pediatrics. You have to be careful. Fever in any infant less than three months of age, there is a high risk of serious bacterial infections. That is, in other words, the risk is nearly 15%. Whereas in older children, it's the risk is only 2%. So less than three months, any fever, you have to be very, very cautious, number one. Number two, fever in a child with the history of febrile conventions. Fever in a malnourished child, immunocompromised child, a prolonged fever, more than a week's time, and fever associated with weight loss. All these six important conditions you have to keep in the back of the mind. When you see such a child, you, it is preferably better to get a pediatric opinion. So let's see the first uh, situation. Here you have a 10 days old neonate. I, I ask, I'll request you to answer in the chat box. Here you have a 10 days old neonate who had a fever of three, two days duration, whose birth weight was three kilos, four, four, 400 grams. The child comes to you with extreme irritability. Mother says, that's a mother, primary, coming in the month of April, May, June, during the hot summer days. Child has been brought from a town bus. She has not covered the child with a cloth. And the child has come with extreme irritability. On examination, child's weight was only 2.5 kilos. Child has got ne lost nearly 900 grams. That is more than 20% of its birth weight. On examination, sunken fontanelle was there. Child was dehydrated. So such a situation, what is your diagnosis? Please write down the chat box. Type immediately. I'm sure that all of you have written properly. The answer, as you rightly mentioned, is dehydration fever. So how to differentiate dehydration from fever? 
from an infectious fever. Very simple. Usually dehydration fever occurs with one summer months, particularly in a mother who brings a child in a hot summer day, exposed to sunlight without covering. Usually in the first 15 days of life, there is a significant weight loss of more than 10%. And there is a decreased urine output. Sometimes you can have a high serum bilirubin level. And there can be hypernatremia also. The first important thing here in this child is not parastamol. You need to correct the dehydration. You need to put the baby to breast. You need to keep the child in a uh, well uh, uh, cold room, like air conditioned room in your consultation chamber for some time. If possible, give a reduced ORS. And then, even if you make a diagnosis of dehydration fever, as I told you, serious bacterial infections are very high incidence in neonates. You need to investigate that is septic workup has to be done. Then even a child with dehydration fever. If the septic workup is negative, you need not start on antibiotics. So here you have a 20 days neonate with three days fever. The mother complains of mild rhinorrhea and the child is active in the interfebrile period. And there is a history of fever in the father. Father visited uh, a metropolitan city two days earlier and then he got a dry hacking cough, high grade fever, sore throat, severe body pain. And the CBC CRP blood culture CSF was also done because the child was having high grade fever. Child was started on septrioxone considering serious bacterial infection. Then you know, what will be your next step? There is a history of contact with a fever in a family who has got respiratory symptoms. The father has got respiratory fever. Probably looks like Viralness. So, how will you approach? The answer is very simple. After seeing the reports, which was normal, we thought probably it could be flu. We took uh, two throats up, which was positive for the both for the father and also for the child. So, immediately we made a diagnosis of influenza. Child was started on oseltamivir. Normally, oseltamivir should not be started for children less than 14 days. This child being 20 days, we have started on Oseltamir. The child recovered very well in a matter of few hours. That is, within 36 hours, child condition, general condition improved. The most important message is, even if you have a viral illness, even if you have PCR positivity, in neonates, whenever there is a high-grade fever, always you need to do another investigation, which is urine microscopy and urine culture. Please remember to do these tests, even if you have bacteremia or any other illness. Always, hidden UTI is very, very highly common in neonates. You need to do it whenever you have a febrile child. So, what does Nelson textbook of pediatrics teach us? Please remember, as I told you, serious bacterial infections in less than 90 days is 15%. The two, very difficult by looking at the child because they may appear normal and they can have serious bacterial infections. And uh, uh, you have to be very, very careful because evaluation and uh, giving the proper guidance is very, very important. I'm just to tell you the management algorithm for children less than 39, three months. So when you have a child more than 100.4 in less than 90 days with or without focus, the first thing you need to see is whether the child is sick or well-looking. If the child is sick-looking, first thing you need to do is hospitalize. Take, do CBC, band neutrophil ratio, CRP, urine routine, culture, and if, if needed, do an LP and also start on one hand antibiotics and on other hand investigations. These things has to be done, done as early as possible in a sick child less than 90 days. On the contrary, if the child is a well-looking child and if it is less than one month with a fever of more than 100.4, even this child should be hospitalized for observation and septic screening has to be done. If the screen is abnormal, we need to go ahead and give IV antibiotics. Whereas in a child is well-looking child who is more than one month but less than three months, you can observe at home provided they are from a short distance and they can know the, the reliability of the caregivers is very, very important. If you cannot rely upon them, if they are from a long distance, always it is better to keep them also under observation in the hospital and start doing septic screen tests. If it is positive, 
treat the child. The skin is normal and the urine is also normal. You can probably send the child back home and then monitor the child at home and repeat the screen if needed. So this has to be continued regularly till the child becomes a febrile. This is the mal management algorithm for children below 90 days. Having seen for children less than three months, now let's go to older children. Here you have a school going adolescent boy who has a fever of six days duration. This boy has gone for a school tour to Mumbai, recently come back. They had a tour of 10 days and he has come back. He has come with uh, two episodes of vomiting and a severe abdominal pain. On examination, he was perfectly all right. His capillary refill time was all right. Vitals were stable. Blood pressure was normal. He was having a mild fever that was around 99. Otherwise, everything was fine. In a such a situation, uh, adolescent boy, fever six days, nothing localizing, only vomiting and abdominal pain. So what are, what are the things that will run into your mind? I'm sure with the current situation in our country, the first thing, the child may be in a prodromal enteritis, number one. And second, most important thing, what we see in our day-to-day -day practice is viral illnesses with a gastritis. And of course, we should never forget these two. One is a dengue, another is an enteric fever. And whenever there is a vomiting and abdominal pain, all children, irrespective of age, you have to keep UTA in the back of the mind. And uh, scrub always need to be kept in the mind along with malaria. So with these seven diseases in the back of the mind, let me ask you, how will you proceed? I'm sure you will all agree with me. You will, Because the fever is more than six days, you do a basic investigations. Our basic investigations reveals a normal hemoglobin with a leukopenia of total, total count of 4,500. The differential count shows eosinopenia. The platelet count is normal. Urine routine is normal. Malaria rapid detection test is negative. The viral which was done on slide method was 1 in 80. And the technician has written as positive. And typhoid test is IgG positive, IgM negative. Scrub type is also, also negative. All those things we thought in our DD were all ruled out. So here you have the report. So what will be your next? So what is striking here is the most important thing is Friends, those who are attending CME, please stop doing this white all. If at all you want to do white all, please do it after seventh day. Do not do it on fifth day or sixth day. You have to do only by tube method. And if both O and H are positive more than 160, you have to give importance as typhoid. With only one in 80, the lab technician has written positive. Do not give importance to that. So ideally to draw. Stop doing wide out. If at all you do it correct, if you do, if you want to do, if you don't have any facilities, do it as per protocol. So, when having looked at this, in vast majority of the children with entry fever, nearly 80% do have eosinopenia. This is an infection disease secret. Whenever you see a WBC, Coulter, CBC report, First, look at the eosinophils. If there is a leukopenia with the eosinophilia with a normal hematocrit, probably you are dealing with enteric fever. If there is a eosinophilia with anemia, you are dealing with malaria. So these two things you have to keep in the back of the mind. So blood culture in a case of enteric fever is mandatory. It is a gold standard. And also please remember, even after giving antibiotics, salmonella is very easy to grow. And it will give you an antibiotic susceptibility also. Friends, vast majority of the Salman law in Mumbai, this boy has had a pan, pan, pan puri in Mumbai all the seven days. Probably the bacterial load was very heavy. He got typhoid. So when, you, when there is a child who has traveled to Mumbai, invariably the child will have ciprofloxin resistance. So ciprofloxin resistance is very high in Mumbai. Nearly more than 90% of the typhoid cases are resistant to quinolones. So, so I request everybody who are attending this conference to develop a culture of culturing. Whatever the disease, always do a culture before giving antibiotics. And the serology is unreliable. Never do white all.
So the drug of choice in a well child is Cefixim, 20 mg per kg weight. In a sick child, it is Ceftrioxone, 100 mg per kg weight. Please do not use Cefetaxim because this typhoid bacteremia, localized bacteremia happens in the bile. Ceftrioxone is excreted in the bile and it can be given as a BD dose. It's a correct drug for enteric fever. Cefetaxim, uh, it needs a higher dose and it has to be given six hourly. It is not the drug of choice in the enteric fever. And astromycin is not the first line drug. It has to be used as a second line drug. The best drug is in outpatient is Cefixim, 20 mg per kg weight. You have to give these antibiotics for at least seven days after the defervescence of fever or a total period of 14 days. Whereas in astromycin, you can give for a period of seven days. The astromycin has got a good, uh, another important, very, very important positive effect. That is astromycin is deposited in the Golgi apparatus. It will give a post-antibiotic effect and the uh, recrudescence of typhoid is practically zero when you use astromycin. So we have seen short febrile illnesses. First we saw fever in less than three days, uh, less than three months. Now we have seen short febrile illness. Whenever you see a child with short febrile illness, please keep all these six diseases in the back of the mind. When you have a fever beyond four days, sick looking, child with a coated tongue, a bradycardia with a tipped spleen, with the eosinophenia, think of enteric fever. Whenever there is a fever, disappearance of fever, reappearance of fever, with retroorbital pain, rashes during fever and rashes during recovery period, with the rising hematocrit, please think of dengue. There is a fever, chills, aches, myalgia, sore throat, dry cough, watery diarrhea, think of influenza. Suppose there is a malaria, splenomegaly, splenohepatomegaly, eosinophilia, you think of malaria. If there is a tick bite, travel to forest or a falls or a endemic tick, you can say an endemic area. With the presence of look for a shell, Undress the child, look for all the hidden areas behind the scrotum, intracrutial fold, behind the ears. If you, if you are happy, you can find out an Escher. Escher can be present in 6 to 70% of the cases. Then you have Rickettsia, single dose of your, your doxycycline given for 5 days will reduce the fever which has been running for weeks together. And if you have a child with severe myalgia with the multisystem involvement, with thrombocytopenia. Sometimes there may be jaundice or there may not be jaundice. If there is a spleen or hepatomegaly with ultrasound, there are splenic microabscesses in the liver and spleen with a night sweating, that is order, which has got a pungent order. It is brucellosis until proven otherwise. If there is a conjectable suffusion, it is leptospirosis. And always keep non-infectious cause of fever in the back of the mind. Particularly in uh, older children, you have to think of collagen uh, muscle disorders like sojia, malignancies, drug-induced fever in the back of the mind. So you need to do a thorough head-to-foot evaluation. Particularly, I request all of you to undress the child and see the hidden areas. And the main, the mantra in short pyrexia is if they come daily for three days, four days, you have to evaluate you have to re-evaluate, you have to re-evaluate repeatedly because it is an evolving illness. What was not present on day one will come to surface on day four. Child would have come for fever on day three, day four, you can see a lymph node that is jumping up in the neck. So you have to keep on repeatedly evaluating the child. Triaging for the red flag signs is very, very important. Do not do CBC on day one. Always rule out UTA by doing urine microscopy. And always consider local epidemiology. Now we have lots of cases of uh, pneumonia in our hospital. Particularly ICU is full of methicillin resistant pneumonias. So you should always have a local epidemiology. And please remember these two tests, CRP and prolactin, uh, procalcitonin, have limited value in infection disease practice. In bone and joint infections, do not do procalcitonin. CRP has has got a lot of limitations. It is false positive in 11% of the cases. It's an inflammatory market released by the liver. 
even in the absence of infection, can in trauma or injury, inflammation, pregnancy, subjective sleep apnea, type 2 diabetes, obesity, you can have a CRP elevator. So some of the viral illnesses, adenovirus, you can have a ICRP. Please remember if the CRP is less than 2 milligram, it is unlikely to be bacterial. Between 2 to 6, it can be either viral or bacterial. More than 6, the chance of bacterial is high, but you cannot definitely say. Please, whenever you see a child on third day and fourth day of fever with elevated CRP, do not look at the CRP alone. You have to calculate uh, uh, estimated CRP velocity. What is this estimated CRP velocity? It is nothing but the duration of symptoms. For 90 hours of fever, 90 hours divided by CRP, 90, 90 hours divided by 90 CRP. That is one. If the estimated CRP is more than 3, probably it is bacterial. So if the estimated CRP is 1 in this case, so it is probably viral. So you have to, for every case, who has got a short bacterial or a prolonged bacterial, prolonged illnesses, you need to do estimated CRP velocity. So here you have a child who has got follicles in the tonsils. The child came with not able to take food. Child had a watermelon juice from outside. Child, on examination, there are lots of follicles on the tonsils. So this child, what is your diagnosis? Please write in your chat box. And what is the commonest organism that causes your diagnosis? And how do you treat? What drug will you use? How long will you give? That is the answer. You have to type it as fast as possible. Yeah. Vast majority of started typing. The answer is, you are, everybody is correct. The answer is acute follicular tonsillitis. The only organism that causes this is group A beta amyloidic streptococci. The drug is simple amoxicillin for a period of 10 days at the dose of 40 mg per kg per day. Do not give clavonic acid. It will increase the cost of therapy and also side effects. And never give astromycin as a first line drug. This organism, group A beta amyloidic streptococcus, is 22% of the time is resistant to astromycin. Whereas, this organism is among the two organisms, group A beta and streptococci, and your uh, uh, spiral loss do not have have not developed resistance against penicillin, spirochetes. Other than these two organisms, all organisms have developed resistance against penicillin since the time of invention. So here you have a 12 month old child was a cough, cold, fever of more than 103 for two days. Child comes to you on day four. He becomes irritable and he was pulling his ears, both the ears, and he was crying. The whole night he was crying. So I'm sure by this history, you must have come to a reasonable conclusion what is the diagnosis. The most important thing is this acute arthritis media has to be diagnosed by using an otoscope. I request all the pediatricians who are attending this conference to have autoscope by your side. If possible, you have to have an autoscope that has a bulb and create a... Uh, it's a, You have to monitor the tympanic membrane movement. You must have a bulb and an autoscope or a simple autoscope is sufficient. Pneumatic autoscope is better. So here you have an erythema in the drum, loss of anatomical landmarks, and there is a bulging tympanic membrane which goes to prove that it is acute arthritis media. During seasons, particularly in younger children, vast majority of these children do have acute arthritis media and these conditions went to give antibiotics. Please remember them as from six months to two years when there is there is a three indications. If the symptoms are severe or if there is an autoria in a single site or if there is a bilateral arthritis media even without autoria, you need to give antibiotics. In children more than two years, the message is you can have a watchful approach. Many a times you can have viruses that can cause arthritis media. So if you have a severe disease or autoria with acute arthritis media with severe symptoms, you can give antibiotics. Otherwise, if, even if it is bilateral, you need not give antibiotics in children more than two years. You can have a watchful approach. So when do you use amoxicillin? When do you use amoxicillin? 
This is a very, very hundred million dollar question. Please remember if the child has not received any antibiotic in the past 30 days, child does not have concurrent full and conjunctivitis. If the child is not allergic to penicillin, you can give amoxicillin. Whereas if the child has received antibiotic in the last 30 days, any antibiotic, or there is a concurrent full and conjunctivitis, or there is a history of recurrent otitis media non responsive to amoxicillin. You can give amoxicillin instead of amoxicillin at a higher dose of amoxicillin. You have to calculate 80 mg per kg of amoxicillin. It has to be given for 10 days. So now we have the child who has got a fever of 5 days with painful maturation. Child is febrile, fever is 1 or 2. On examination, urine was turbid with plenty of pustules. Child's total count also was high, elevated. Polymorph was 18. CRP was 12. Culture was sent. In this child, what do you suspect? I'm sure by looking at the child, by the history, looking at the urine, on the microscopy, you can um, you would have made an uncomplicated first UTI. So in children more than three months of age, if the child is not toxic and child is able to accept feeds, it is called uncomplicated UTI. You take culture and start on cefixim. The cefixim dose is around 10 to 15 milligram per kg per day, two divided doses. And wait for the culture report. In this case, E. coli was grown more than 10.5. Luckily, it, does, it was not a ESBL producing organism. It was sensitive to cefixim. Child became all right with cefixim for 10 days. So, the antimicrobials, what we as pediatricians, we use is cefixim or covamoxiclib. We don't do use other antibiotics. Cefixim or covamoxiclib. So here you have a similar child who has a grade 4 VUR. Child was started on chemoprophylaxis, but they stopped giving chemoprophylaxis. Child came back with the fever. So in such situations, you must know when to give antibiotic prophylaxis, particularly in UTA. So by giving antibiotic prophylaxis, you can reduce the risk of recurrent UTA, but only drawback is the child can develop antibiotic resistance. So antibiotic prophylaxis is indicated when there is a high-grade vesicovirutary reflex, more than 3 to 5 BUR. In infants with low-grade BUR with recurrent febrile UTA, in children with bladder and bowel dysfunction. So you should never give antibiotic prophylaxis after first episode of UTA. Sometimes you have a dilemma. You start an antibiotic, child becomes apabrile, but culture unfortunately shows the antibiotic is resistant. If the child is clinically improving, continue with the same antibody, but monitor the child carefully. So you have a child, 60 days old child, with 22,000 polys and 90 percent, uh, 22,000 total count polys, 90 percent. In such children, you have to think of three things. One is occult pneumonia, another is occult UTA, third is occult bacteria. In this child, this child was tachypneic. We did an X-ray chest. We found out the left upper lobe pneumonia. So here you have a watery diarrhea child, plus a running nose, stool microscopy, entamoeba hysteritica was seen. And the child was treated by a quack with amikacin and metrodazole. So the message here is, whenever you have a watery diarrhea in a young child who's solely breastfed, probably it is viral in nature, give only ORS and zinc, and never give combo drugs like norfloxin, metrodazole, or ofloxin, or norfloxin, because vast majority of them are viral. If at all it is bacterial, it has to be only cefixin. These combo drugs does more harm than good and never give anti-motility drugs to stop diarrhea. If you think it is bloody diarrhea, diagnosed as bacillite dysentery, give only cefixin. If there is a stool that shows he has cyst, do not treat because cyst is normal. Everybody will have cyst in the stools. Only when there is trophozoid, you have to treat. Here you have a child who is one and a half years old fever of two weeks duration, child is not moving the left hip. The child has received amoxiclave as outpatient. The child counts are non-contributory 
with the CRP that is 54, estimated CRP velocity is less than one. So X-ray was done by the practitioner, does not have any contribution. Only thing is that when the column went up there, which to move away from the So your clinical diagnosis is septic arthritis and you do a hip ultrasound and also MRI, which shows a left hip uh, septic arthritis. In such a conditions, never rely upon procalcitonin. Pro That's the most important message. And these children will need always parental antibiotics for a period of around three weeks, three to four weeks. If the child is less than three months of age, you have to give IV cefiroxime. Child who is more than five years of age, you have to give cefasolin because the commonest organism is staphylococcus. Suppose if you have a community that contains methicillin resistant, you can give vancomycin and ticoplanin upfront. In neonates and immunocompromised, most of them are gram-negative infection. You need to give a wider coverage hitting all the organisms. Here you have a child six years old with a platelet count of 90,000. Child is otherwise active, playful, but the mother wants admission. In such situations, do not admit the child just because thrombocytopenia has that. So you must know what conditions need admission. Whenever there is a danger sign, all these six are there. If these danger signs are there, you need to admit. Please remember, low platelet count is not an indication for admission or it is not an indication for discharge. Even in dengue, please remember, dengue is not a platelet disease. You can have a sick child with near normal platelets. At the same time, you can have a normal child with a very low platelets. There is no guidelines recommendation to improve the platelet count by giving drugs. If there is any danger sign, you can refer a child immediately, even if the platelet counts are normal. The carry home message from today is forget platelets, focus patient. So let me come to the last slide. So if you have supra-diaphragmatic infection, respect low and respect infection, above diaphragm, organisms are gram positive, use only amoxicillin, 35 to 40 milligram per kg per day per day, three divided doses. If you got infradiaphragmatic infection, either GI or urinary tract infection, organisms are gram negative, use only cefixin. In skin and soft tissue, first generation cephalosporin, cephalexin or cephalotoxin. So let me come to the last slide. Always you must have a traffic light signal approach. If the baby is sick, admit treat. If the baby has got focus, you find out the focus. Tonsillitis, amoxicillin, impetigo, cephalotoxin. <laughs> that is a low. If the baby does is not sick, there is no focus. It is green. You can wait. Just monitor the child. Do not give any drugs. Wait and watch. <laughs> so I request everybody to follow rule of three. What is three investigations in pediatrics? On day one, urine routine. On day two, day three, CBC. If there is a respiratory symptoms or the CBC shows polymorphic leukocytosis, do XHS. Do not do XHS for all coughers because cough is a respiratory receptor trigger. It's a luminant pathology. <laughs> do not do XHS for all coughers. If you think pneumonia, do XHS. Only three antibiotics, amoxicillin, cefixin, cefalexin. With that, i like to thank you all. I once again like to thank the IMACGB. Please note down my number, 98422-1179. You can send a request to my WhatsApp number. I'll send you the slides. And also, if you want to join Infection Disease Certificate course, I request you to send a personal message to me. Now I request my fellow speakers, Dr. Ranganandan, Dr. Suresh Kumar to share the slides. And also I request Dr. Mohan Kumar, who is a renowned epidemiologist, to say a few words about the course. Dr. Mohan yeah. Kumar, 
Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for the introduction and nice speech about the acute fibrinolysis in pediatric age group. And I hope uh, the listeners might have, uh, you know, understood the importance and uh, the practical points, which is not covered in the textbook. You have nicely covered, and uh, I hope it's a good learning to them. Okay, friends. So now talking more about uh, the scores, I just take this opportunity to introduce our. Uh, Fellowship uh, certificate portion in first this is an infection control. And uh, so this is not a new course. So we 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 are we are pretty uh, traveling with IMA uh, CGP for the past three years. Even during the COVID times, we were uh, trying to teach this course because there was a lot of need for uh, the general practitioners like all of us to upgrade or update ourselves in the current trend of uh, the evidence has generated across infectious diseases uh, cancer globe. So what is this FCAD course? It's basically, this is targeted for the doctors who are uh, at the practice, who are you know, preparing for PG, who are you know in the hospital at the ward side hospital, where they are handling infectious diseases. And this is implemented uh, through IMA CGP and uh, thanks to IMA CGP for the continuous enormous support in doing this course in the short times, even during COVID and on mm -hmm. online mode. And uh, so it's, it's predominantly focused on infectious diseases in India and international concern, not only touching about the common diseases, but also the emerging diseases of threat that is actually uh, creating pandemics and emergencies and clusters clustering around the community. And also we try to talk more about, you know, in addition to the uh, identification, diagnosis and management, we also try to see like, how can we uh, try to understand the pattern and uh, build our own uh, list of diseases and then approaches based on our experiences over the whole years. Uh, okay, so what we predominantly try to do this in this course. <clears throat> They're trying to touch CV. We graduated and we see a lot of patients. But what that new thing we are going to do in this course. Basically, we are trying to hear from the peer who are already an eminent uh, so Starbucks and infectious diseases, their experiences, their practical touches, their update in the current trend of infectious diseases. So other than the Namak in the textbook go in the uh, group discussion, we didn't catch up. And, uh, okay. So other than the or practical model, like for example, name this as approach. So in the Madri, or case based scenarios in if we need or update la for clarifications and we also need lot of questions to come back this particular so we don't know to whom we should ask this is, so this is the correct forum where we try to you know receive your inputs and uh, answer your questions and clarify okay this is what uh, the current approach is okay where we did mistakes and uh, why we didn't get a positive uh, outcome of our treatment so on the madri uh, to be, have more confidence in our uh, practice basically uh, this six months course is going to improve our confidence in handling infectious diseases both in routine and also in emergency practices and also uh, to do justice to medical profession as Dr. Spresser and other told AMR is a big threat so always we have a question should we practice uh, of antibiotic or not if so how and why and what antibiotics we don't have a categorical answer to all these questions so, but uh, I had the feedback from the uh, alumni of this course have told that, okay, now we have clarity. Should we practice prescribed antibiotics in this scenario? Yeah. Like that. So, it would, uh, the good platform to upgrade ourselves, refine ourselves, and to, to learn more about the latest trends and uh, uh, purchasing decisions. Okay. Uh, who we are and what, like we were already a successful uh, three cohorts future cohort, and uh, you, you, you guys are going to be in the fourth cohort if you're joining. 120 plus certified doctors across Tamil Nadu, national and international. So we have uh, categories of all this. And thanks to CGP uh, for allowing us to uh, open up for uh, for the need of people being possible more market. So people are given a good good testimonies, good feedbacks about the level of uh, you know uh, confidence in their uh, handling diseases and uh, the way they have clarified their doubts. Okay. Uh, we will put some of the testimonials, uh, videos, and the feedbacks in the official WhatsApp group, uh, you know, which we have already. Uh, we can join that group if needed to be discussed. Okay. Uh, what is this course called for? Snapshot of our So it's an 
You have tailored made it is a six months course. You have tailored made the topics to actually focus on routine clinical practices. Uh, speakers are from, like, for example, hepatitis. Mm -hmm. We get an hepatitis expert. A fever. Now we get a fever expert. If it is uh, sexually transmitted disease, we get an expert in STD. Talk about the practical core thing. What they see in day to day. We're trying to mirror like. The same challenges which we have in residential practice. So we have a pool of uh, experts who are already uh, you know traveling with us for the past three cohorts. And uh classical like textbook presentation, Mario, okay, what is the clinical presentation? What is the path of pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics? And the Marlin. The core practical teaching if a patient walking with walking into your consultation room with the symptoms, let us discuss what it is. Okay. And uh, you all know other, uh, you know, side like registration is now open and, uh, you know, the open course fees, which is right. for us. And uh, uh, it should be a member of ICT, MSCGP, which is again uh, a part of the course registration you can do if you are not so far. Uh, more than 40 national and international faculties we already have and we also try to rope in people from the state health departments and central health departments to talk more about what are the guidelines uh, okay for biomedical waste management they had it so CANN, so like that clean restoration act nine so like that we were trying to touch the more needed areas of uh, you know regulations also into our courses which was well accepted by the past three cohorts uh, and Okay, so it's a, predominantly we are doing this in online and the course plan for Tono So once in two weeks, we'll have a fortnight classes in the weekends predominantly. We try to increase the classes based on the need and request. In addition, we do a big marathon sessions like what we are undergoing now. Uh, we are trying to keep weekend predominantly and we try to mandate IIT person attendance because uh, certificate ka ho, it ka ho, and we are not a teacher, not. Here we are going to try to you know, improve our skills. So we try to keep this attendance mandatory on the, the, the sincerity requirement. And we keep exams both written and viva, where we have three panel uh, experts who come and sit and do an evaluation. In addition to this theory, we also have a practicals. So practicals like in a, uh, or bedside learning. In a, with an experts around and also in the laboratory, how to handle sample or sample in the empty extract from the empty pack from the uh, So, what is happening in the lab, how to interpret and the Marian practical approaches soon we are doing for the for the previous patches. And uh, this is how we are going to do this for part four also. And uh, coming to the credit us, yes, we do credit us and uh, this tenor gives us uh, ten us, we are giving credit us based on your attendance. So since we have uh, observers from the medical council in our team classes, we send the attendance to the uh, medical counselor. Subsequently, we ask our learners to uh, apply for the credit as a credit. It is Tennis uh, is a minimal creditor uh, which is guaranteed in part of this course. Who can join? So you should be an LBS doctor and a practitioner and registered in any, any medical council. And you should have an IMA membership and IMA CTC membership. And uh, so you can join this course. Uh, you are telling in terms of months. And uh, I sincerely thank uh, the core committee who actually uh, are Star Wars in uh, supporting an operation of this course. We have Dr. Mim Nadinsa, who is the uh, course coordinator of the course field. We have uh, Dr. Pramisam, Sir, Dr. Pramisam, Sir, Dr. Pramisam, Sir, Suri Kumar, Sir. Uh, who are jointly, you know, putting their times and brain and uh, uh, see like, you know, in a solicum fly, a pre current and the disease were they okay. Now it is a time for flu or ever. Let us take a topic on flu now so that the practitioners are involved. Apin Mari Uru, regular, we have a regular fixer meeting to see what more we can teach you and how we can learn this. In addition, uh, okay, the, whatever we teach, we have a learning management system sort of in use uh, Google's uh, Google Classroom, which we try to have everybody enroll into it and we share the video recording of the classes, slide materials, assignments, and also the uh, technical materials documents so that we ask you to see the recording again, read the presentations again, so that we put uh, questions in the group and uh, which encourages us to, to learn. In addition, we also uh, ask you to do two assignments at the end of the, and, uh, at the, end of the course where 
assignment is one of the criteria for you to get the course uh, certification. And uh, I hope uh, we are happy to you know answer any what questions. You can get up name and such number and can communicate with us. And I am also happy to uh, clarify any doubts if needed. And, uh, thank you. Meet you all in the course. Over to you, Dr. Nimsa. Hello. Thank you, Dr. Mohan. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the elaborate introduction of the course. I'm sure. The friends who are watching, more than 700 doctors, I'm sure many of you will be interested in joining the Infectious Disease Certificate course. We welcome you all with the folded hands, and I'm sure this will revolutionize your practice. Uh, this will give you lots of information, much more than what you expect. So I, I request all of you to make a generous attempt by contacting any one of us immediately after this end of this uh, meeting. Uh, once again, I like to tell you my co I am the course coordinator. You can please note down my number with your pen and a paper or in your cell phone nine eight four double two triple one seven nine nine eight four double two triple one seven nine. Doctor Naimi Nathan, if you want the slides, what we are going to discuss today about the course, uh, what Doctor Mohan Kumar has uh, discussed. And also my academic teaching slides or Dr. Raghunandan or Dr. Suresh Kumar, please send a request to me. We'll send the, all the slides to you for learning because we want the knowledge to disseminate to the entire country. With that, I'd like to invite Dr. Raghunandan, sir, who is a professor of medicine, Institute of Internal Medicine, MMC Madras Medical College, and RGGGH, Chennai. He was... Uh, National State Coordinator for COVID and also he is a pioneer in adult infectious disease. He has been the mentor of many doctors. So I request with this introduction, brief introduction, I request Dr. Ravnandan sir to take over the podium. He will be discussing with you approach to acute febrile illnesses in adults, particularly in relevance to current settings, the post-COVID setting. Sir, please welcome sir. Raghunandan, sir, please welcome. You can start your lecture, sir. Yeah, you are. You are not audible, sir. Please unmute yourself. You are not audible. Unmute. Slides are visible, but you are not audible. Sir, your slides are clearly visible. But only thing is, you are not audible. Please unmute yourself. Sir, you are not audible, sir. Ravnandan, sir, you are not audible. Am I audible, sir, now? Yes, sir, now you are audible. Now you are audible. Now you are audible. Yes, go ahead, sir. Can you make the slide show, sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you make a slide show? Is it okay, sir? Yeah. Perfect, sir. Go ahead, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, oh, first, perfect, yeah. Sir. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Um, first of all, good evening, all. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Abdul Hassan, sir, the president of uh, Tamil Nadu branch of IMA, Dr. Karthik Prabhu, secretary, Dr. Ananda Chukalingam, Dr. Sindhil Kumar, chairman, our national president, Dr. Bora, sir, Dr. Vivek, Dr. Jailal, sir, our past president, Dr. Sengutruvan, Dr. Suresh Kumar. Dr. Vivek, Dr. Pari and others for uh, uh, permitting us to take this uh, fellowship course for the fourth year continuously. Uh, as Dr. Morgan Kumar said, has already enlightened about this course and it's a, it's a journey that we started four years back and it's really a learning curve, not only for the 
participants and also learning curve for all of us to keep update and sharing the best practices. So I always say it is called a seek. What we trying to seek? Sharing evidence, experience and knowledge. And our Dr. Nemi Nathan sir has rightly said that today we are living in a world of uh, evidence-based medicine versus eminence-based medicine. So I'm sure this uh, six months course of fellowship will go a long way in updating our knowledge, skill and attitude in our clinical practice, especially on infectious diseases. So today, Dr. Nemi Nathan sir has nicely covered about the uh, pediatric components, but most of the principles and concepts what he has shared with us always applies in adult practice also. So I will I will try to go, skip some of the things what he has already mentioned, but I'll try to take it in a different area where in our busy practice, I am sure this focus, this workshop is based on a primary care physicians handling the uh, OP patients as well as IP patients. So what are the common areas that we have to pay attention in our busy practice, especially in di diagnosing acute febrile illness? So the outline of my talk is on the definition and the common causes. And mostly I'll try to focus on the general principles in diagnosis and management. And we'll try to take some case-based discussions at the end. So always we'll go by the guidelines of WHO or the government of India or our public health department. So we'll, let us understand what when we say AFI, what we are trying to mean in real sense. So any febrile illness of two to seven days duration with two or more of the following manifestations like headache, retroorbital pain, myalgia, arthralgia, rash, and hemorrhagic manifestations. Maybe we can add one more, one or two more like vomiting and diarrhea. As Sarah has already mentioned, most of our acute infections or acute febrile illness are predominantly viral in origin. And he has also stressed about the short incubation period because of that transmission is very high. So some of the basic facts we have already mentioned about that, most of them are viral. And most important as a clinician, I think the meticulous history and clinical examination are mandatory for proper clinical diagnosis. As a clinician, we always make a, we have to make a, what is a provisional diagnosis at the end of history and clinical examination. And of course, the investigation might support or try to exclude. So that kind of commitment to a clinical diagnosis is always mandatory, which I'll try to elaborate later. Again, investigation is not, again, Sarah has very simply said that you have to do a hemogram, blood counts, if at all, simple urine examinations. Maybe if the patient is having cough or sputum, maybe you can do a gram strain or a uh, culture of the organisms. Otherwise, not every patient needs elaborate investigations as sometimes we may think. And most of the patient symptomatic and supportive care as all of us are on one platform, we should never use antibiotics for a viral infections. And most important thing is follow up. As the cases goes, I'll tell you the importance of why follow-up of patients and uh, review is so critical in some of the critical cases where sometimes we may miss. So all the difference and other things, I'll just try to skip that. Again, always we say fever is always good. So one of the reassurance things that if the patient is developing fever, definitely we can reassure that patient is responding, responding to the infection in the form of a ward that patient is trying to protect himself. But we always know absence of fever is also not a good sign, especially in severe sepsis. We know hypothermia is not a good sign. Similarly, people with immune suppressed state or maybe in geriatric populations or patients on steroids, they do not develop uh, fever. Okay. So now we'll go to the, as Sarah has already mentioned, the profile of cases. So let us not worry too, about, too much about the common LRI and URI urinary tract, acute gastroenteritis. We'll try to focus on major illnesses of public health importance where, this is more important, where patient might land up in complications. As my teacher, my guru, Dr. C. Rajendran said always, the beauty of clinical medicine depends on the early recognition of, of symptoms and signs of complications. We do treat a lot of typhoid. We do treat malaria. But why some of them are going for complication? Can we pick them early and refer them and put them in a uh, intensive care or something like that? So that is a trick of the trade in our practice. 
most of the infections may be even for example dengue most of them are self limiting but where do we miss we we'll try to understand in a case based scenarios so as i have been telling that chronology of symptoms again whenever a patient has got only two days or three days of acute fever surely mostly as dr neminathan said it could be viral usually typhoid even up to 1 to 2 weeks the fever might persist similarly in scrub typhus so the duration of fever is very very important and also past history of fever i think that's a very important history because we know some of the diseases especially like malaria can relapse so keep that again a diabetic patient with recurrent urinary infections again we have to rule out any obstruction or some other thing that makes him more prone for a recurrent infections again drug history if the patient is on steroids or if the patient is taking some beta blockers they can suppress the heat dissipations or patient on antipsychotic drugs we are talking about neuromelignant syndrome and other things so please always check the drug history and any surgical procedures or again animal bites and any prosthetic and implanted today many of them are having implanted materials in the joints and other things again they can trigger the infections occupational and exposure for zoonotic diseases which when we discuss about scrub we will try to and again travel again travel is very very critical in today's context they say uh, not only we are talking about uh, travel within india a uh, travel abroad today uh, infectious disease occurs in any part of the world can travel around the world in less than 2 to 3 days i believe so again always focus on and also high risk behaviors especially on sexual practices or iv drug addictions all these things make a important contribution in arriving at a clinical diagnosis again comorbidities i will not go into that but fever in a immune suppressed state neutropenic sepsis is another big challenge today lot of patients are undergoing transplants for various reasons or uh, stem cell uh, transfusion uh, therapy like that so handling a neutropenic patient is totally a different challenge and i think they have to be investigated at a higher center so i'll just go to the simple clinical examination where in fact if you take care of simple things uh, big things will take care of uh, themselves i'll just to, i'll just go in a methodological manner of how to approach a fever case come to a clinic how to go about first step is check whether patient is conscious and oriented if the patient is confused even with say 3 or 4 days of fever that gives a important clue for two or three differential diagnosis fever in fact the term typhoid the term typhoid itself means clouding of consciousness so if a fever with delirium comes to you think of one typhoid or it could be a early cerebral malaria or it could be a meningitis or encephalitis not only that even hypoperfusion to the brain because of dehydration you know i fever itself can cause dehydration vomiting diarrhea profuse sweating all these things can trigger hypotension even a simple hypotension hypotension can trigger a clouding of consciousness or a altered sensorium so this we have seen very repeatedly when we are managing a cases of dengue so the conscious and orientation is very important clinical sign vital sign make sure they are okay of course checking on their pulse and other things i want to check one important point on blood pressure especially when a patient is having a postural hypotension again we are talking about um tourniquet test in dengue we, we today we don't have time to explain everything but i'm just telling you the importance of recording a blood pressure in a fever case one you check for a postural hypotension number two check for the tourniquet test that we will be discussing in our regular work, i mean uh, fellowship programs and another important thing is head to foot examination i think every time even if you have seen the patient yesterday and patient is again coming for review today don't assume yesterday i have checked a general examination today i will go to something else please don't do what you have not picked up yesterday or what not you have on appear yesterday might appear today i'll give a simple example is presence of eshkar yesterday you would not have seen that but today you have to look for which would not have been there yesterday so please do a meticulous head to foot examination and especially in the eyes look for presence of anemia and jaundice i think these are two important maybe one more is the subconjunctival suffusion 
because we are talking about five common diagnoses of say dengue, leptospirosis, scrub, hepatitis, like that malaria. So always presence of jaundice and fever, we know first we have to rule out hepatitis or it could be a manifestation of other diseases also. Number two, presence of anemia. A fellow who you know was normal, suddenly is developing malaria, I mean uh, anemia. Maybe we have to rule out a cerebral malaria with severe hemolysis. So like that subcontinental hemorrhage, we know it could be a part of leptospirosis. So similarly, fever with rash. Again, that is a very big topic, fever with rash. Most of our exanthematous and other things, please look for that. And also, when you are looking for this rash and other things, depending on the natural history of the disease, you should know when to look for. For example, in a case of typhoid, the rashes will appear only on the second week. It may not be there on the first week. So like that, you should know the important natural history and their clinical features so that you pick up that. I already mentioned about Eshkart, similarly pallor and jaundice, hemorrhages which we have discussed. Again, Sarah has shown very good pictures of tonsils and other things. And one more, one more point I want to add what Sarah has mentioned is presence of the diphtheritic memory. Uh, friends, recently, two years back, we had around 50 cases of diphtheria in adults. That is more than 15 years to 40 years. We have admitted more than 50 cases of diphtheria. We thought diphtheria is gone, but still it is there. So unless be aware, especially we saw people coming from North India, working in our state, their immunization status is not proper. So always keep even talking about emerging and re-emerging diseases. Recently, we had outbreak of diphtheria also. So again, all these things, I'm, uh, which I'm sure all of you know the importance of that. And most of our viral fever present with arthralgia and myalgia. And of course, they can have vomiting and they, this is a general manifestation. Individual diseases, I'll try to go in a problem-based learning in the last. So again, presence of uh, cardiovascular examination, whether he has got some valvular heart disease, all of us know the importance of infective endocarditis, or it could be a viral myocarditis. In fact, uh, it could be a viral or even it could be a bacterial myocarditis in the form of diphtheria, which we have picked up. Of course, we have to check the respiratory system for uh, another common thing that we have coming uh, across is the influenza like the illness that we will discuss. Again, abdomen. I think one of the important system that we have to examine however busy we are in our practice is proper examination of the abdomen. Just a simple clue I will tell you whether patient has got only hepatomegaly or patient has got splenomegaly also or either one. So if a patient has got hepatosplenomegaly soft, we know we are going to deal with their typhoid. If it is a firm, it's we are dealing with malaria. It's a gross thing. Again, in the dengue, predominantly we have hepatomegaly. Usually we don't get a splenomegaly. And also the abdominal pain, very, very important. Tenderness, even in dengue we can get or in case of perforation, we can get that. So the examination of abdomen is a very, very important thing. And also look for any free fluid. Again, we know in dengue also we may get ascites. So <clears throat> other systems we are going to do. Again, I will not spend too much time on investigations, but at least I have a basic hemogram. So that will give you the baseline idea. And of course, another important blood investigation that always helps you in acute fibrillin illnesses, look for parasites, especially for malaria and uh, microfilaria will help you. Sarah has already touched about the CRP and other uh, uh, acute phase reactants. So I will not go into that. Depending on the individual severity of the disease, it can be correlated. Again, Sarah has nicely said the limitation of using Vidal in our day to day practice. Of course, we have some tests for uh, MSAT tests for uh, leptospirosis and scrub and other things. So the general principle of doing these antibody titers are please do after one week. So that is the early thing. It's not going to help us. So again, value of X-ray ultrasound, especially of uh, looking for uh, any ascites or gallbladder thickening in case of dengue, it may help you. Similarly, X-ray chest in pneumonia, definitely. And maybe some localized lapses, something they are the higher order investigations may be helpful to you. So again, I'm not going into this, all these things. We'll go to case-based scenario as we are running short of time. I'll go to the specific case-based scenarios. 
So again, control of fever is more important. Make sure hydration and nutrition. I think that is one of the most important. Sometimes we forget in our fever management because I already mentioned high fever can cause dehydration, especially now we are talking about uh, uh, heat stroke, heat uh, exhaustion, all those already summer has set in. So keep this hydrating the patient especially in not only infectious as well as in non-infectious cases, it's very, very crucial. And role of antibiotics and other things, Sarah has already touched on that. We'll come to the case-based discussions. Okay. So again, we have to be very careful when you're dealing in special situations like pregnancy. Again, the guideline says whenever you handle a patient in pregnancy with fever, better to admit and investigate. Again, I repeat, better to admit and investigate a case of fever in pregnancy because late diagnosis can cause fetal mortality. So again, elderly, they can, uh, the clinical manifestations, what we read in the textbooks and what we see in the elderly is totally different. Again, I already mentioned about neutropenic sepsis and immune suppressed individuals. So these are the various syndromic approach uh, that we can do. So we'll go in few clinical scenarios. And again, sometimes you have to keep it in mind about the rare causes of acute febrile illness, like uh, the poisoning, the thura poisoning, amphetamine toxicity. Again, pontain bleed is a well-known differential diagnosis of hyperpyrexia where intracerebral bleeds, it resets the hypothalamic uh, thermostat and patient can have a high fever. And uh, of course, some factious fevers are there. And today we are talking about uh, global health where any infections can spread so fast and sometimes we may get some new diseases like Hanta fever or yellow fever, something like that. So now I think the most important part is today, let us have some case-based discussion so that how to go about in our uh, clinical practice. So I'll try to uh, take around four cases for our discussion today. A 20-year-old boy comes to the OPD with sudden onset of high fever, joint pains, vomiting, tiredness of two days duration. I think uh, today everybody is now still talking about dengue. Dengue is going to be with us as long as our Aedes mosquitoes are going to be with us. So we cannot forget dengue. So in this case, how to go about? So I always keep a very simple formula. What to ask for, what to look for, what to test for, then how do you manage? And we should also our, know our limitations. Sometimes early referral will save the life of the patients. Again, I repeat, sometimes early referral, we should know what are the danger signs, red flag signs, so that we can refer them early before the patient goes to irreversible shock. So in this particular case, I think the diagnosis first that we should always rule out is the dengue fever. So I'll take this particular slide to explain the nuances of dengue and also differential diagnosis. I think uh, all, most, all of you would have seen this slide so many times. So I will not go into all the features. In an acute febrile illness, when will you suspect dengue? When a patient comes to your OPD, when will you sus suspect? So I'll give you three or four important clinical features. Number one, sudden onset of high fever. Sir, I have to go to the hospital. I have to go to the sir. So normally we know patients don't come to us within one or two days normally. But these patients, because of the high fever, one high fever, but three important warning symptoms, tiredness, fatigability, and lethargy. Sir, all young people, 20 years, 30 years. So sudden onset of fever, of course, you know, the breakbone fever. And they can have, of course, nausea, I mean, vomiting, diarrhea, and other features. So whenever a patient comes with increased tiredness, for example, uh, we know that typhoid also causes tiredness and fatigability. But that won't happen on the first week. It happens only on the third or following recovery. They'd say, typhoid poetry said, still I feel tired. That is different. But here, otherwise a healthy adult comes with sudden onset of fever, with tiredness, uh, fatigability, lethargy, with break bone fever. Think of that, number one. Number two, again, a patient of dengue can come to you during the first phase or during the critical as well as during the recovery phase also. So you should know the duration of the illness Again, the treatment of dengue is nothing but take care of hydration, monitoring the vitals. So I'll give you two, three important points that you have to watch. Number one is the capillary filling time. So capillary filling time and also mentioned about tourniquet test. And most important is the urine output. 
in fact one of the first question you should ask for any fever especially when you are suspecting dengue eppa pa kadasiya urine pona whatever busy you are please ask that kaalaiye 10 manikku nam op la ukkarrom eppa pa kadasiya urine pona neethu night or 8 9 manikku pona doctor appum pove illa so more than 12 hours he has not passed urine otherwise he may look apparently normal in fact we call them as walking shock also so that is where pick up the early symptoms and signs and also high risk group for example obesity pregnancy children uh, geriatric people and uh, patient on uh, immunosuppressant so these all the high risk group they need definite admissions for evaluation again as far as treatment is concerned control the fever maintain the hydration watch for complications so that is what i was saying about recognizing the early symptoms and signs of complication one is the plasma leak in the form of pleural effusion or ascites or a bleed so watch this and make sure patient is a febrile for 48 hours before you plan for a discharge so when your regular program we will discuss more on this issue and again sir has mentioned about hematocrit hematocrit is very sensitive indicator than platelet don't worry too much on platelets monitor your platelets it's a hemo concentration if platelet is uh increasing that means patient is going for a hemo concentration and again as far as diagnostic test we don't need a test at all i would say but at least epidemiological you should do a ns1 antigen in the first four days or igm which may persist for three months or your igg will persist for uh lifetime so these are the few important points for dengue next closest differential diagnosis for acute febrile illness here is leptospirosis again okay. one important point that clinically that helps us is presence of myalgia usually that muscle pain will be more significant in they i mean in lepto compared to uh, dengue where joint pains are there bone pains are there next is presence of some hematuria or presence of subconjunctival hemorrhage we have seen some patients with bleeding they come with hematemesis and melina also i do remember during my post graduation when the patient can go for hemorrhagic uh, leptospirosis or they can also go for a trick leptospirosis so they can present with jaundice and hepatocellular dysfunction also so again this leptospirosis is easily treatable again the drug of choice those days we used to give penicillin but today doxycycline is a sagala gala divarani i would say so i request the uh, listeners who are attending this program the japi the association of physicians of india has brought out a special manual on use of doxycycline in uh, last month i will try to share that with you so it gives you a real confidence of using doxy when undifferentiated comes early in our practice how a doxy can be helpful in leptospirosis or even it can be uh, helpful in scrub or even they have been using in dengue like that that we will discuss uh, in that uh, regular workshops so this particular slide clearly tells the uh, clinical and the epidemiological and bacteriological uh, criteria for diagnosing a leptospirosis so again fluid management because we are talking about inpatient management also if the patient is not able to tolerate fluids definitely they need admissions again fluid should not be given more than 48 hours usually they do recover otherwise fluid overload can occur in dengue so these slides as i said we'll try to share with you later it gives you a broad criteria of how to manage a case of uh, dengue in a inpatient setup so we call it as start with higher 10 ml per kg body weight and try to slowly de escalate it now we'll go to the case scenario a 30 year old man with frequent travel history has come to opd with history of fever dry cough headache running nose of 3 days duration i think when i cross check with some of our friends in the city of chennai i think this still even though we are talking about influenza like illness uh, again we have recovered from covid but still that overlap syndrome of uh, ili is still there in our practice so again the same thing what to ask what to look what to test and what to how to manage so now we use a definition called ili influenza like illness case definition this is very very important because when you write a diagnosis of ili there should be a uniformity so they say acute respiratory infection whether it's viral or thing don't worry acute respiratory infection with measured fever of more than 38 and cough and with onset within the last 10 days 
So this is a very important definitions because today the ICMR is also doing a continuous survey across India on ILI and SARI. What is SARI? SARI is a severe acute respiratory infection definition. It is a fever with history of fever more than 38 and cough onset within last 10 days, but important criteria is requiring hospitalization. So uh, as a family practitioners, we should be aware of this definition of ILI and SARI because unless we share our experience, is there any recent increase of SARI or increase increase of ILI and we have a setup, you can refer to a medical college where they can do a panel of respiratory viruses. Usually we do get only influenza viruses, maybe COVID or rhinovirus or adenovirus like that. This constant vigilance, that's what the more important message for our friends is, you should be constantly vigilant of this ILI illness. Already we faced COVID, so we should be vigilant to know whether any new variants are appearing in the community. Again, the ILI can even present as a nausea, vomiting and diarrhea initially. This is where I was mentioning about follow-up. So initially they may come to you only with fever, diarrhea and vomiting. So many of us will say, okay, we are dealing with gastroenteritis, but ask them to come for follow-up or you follow up through telephonically because on third day or fourth day, they may develop the respiratory symptom and turn out to be a influenza-like illness. So again, they can have pharyngitis, hoarseness, myalgia, non-purulent conjunctivitis. Usually they don't have rash and children can have group otitis and also they can have a decrease in the baseline activity and loss of appetite in children. So this categorization also, you should be very clear in your clinical practice. So what is category A is mild symptoms, ILI, no lab test, no treatment is required. This is cat A. When the, what is cat B? The same symptoms, but occurring in a high risk group. So I already mentioned pregnancy, obesity, diabetes, pre-existing chronic diseases. Definitely the use of Tamiflu is really helpful. Sarah has also mentioned about in pediatric practice. So in adult practice, we give 75 milligrams twice daily for five to seven days. So this really works in our practice. So keep this in our mind because ILI is still a problem even though we have not seen much of COVID. Again, CAT-C means those who need admissions, definitely they have to be admitted in ICU and other supportive care should be done and rule out other, this is in fact, they say for testing, you are only going to do testing for cat C. So please remember, cat B again, they say no test is required. You can start them on Tamiflu straight away with some symptomatic uh, treatment of reducing fever and other things. So this is cat C. So we already know about COVID. I will not go into that thing. Again, case, case three, 50 year old farmer comes to OPD with history of fever for one week duration treated locally, but symptoms did not sub subside. So we are now handling a patient of more than seven days of fever. The other significant history is here, farmer. So, I mean, exposure to animals, zoonotic should be thought of. So let us see what are the things we should ask and look and test for. So this is a classical presence of Eshkar. So as far as uh, scrub typhus is concerned in our, in our state, for example, Krishnagiri, Darbaburi, Vellur, Coimbatore, Chennai, these are the few districts where we do see a lot of scrub cases. There are some interesting uh, experiences of managing a scrub that I will try to share quickly with you. Sometimes Sarah was also mentioning, normally it don't appear very obviously in the inguinal region, under the breast tissue, in the axilla or in the external genitalia. These are the sites which we normally examine. So that is where this these uh, eshkas can appear. If it is there, it is diagnostic. If it is not, you cannot rule out that also. Keep it in mind. So classical symptoms, again, fever, eshkar, lymphadenopathy. Again, presence of, uh, for example, regional lymphadenopathy may be there. But at the end of one week, a generalized lymphadenopathy can also start in scrub typhus. So other things like respiratory symptoms is very unique to uh, eshkar. I mean, to scrub typhus. They present to us in a form of lymphadenopathy, I mentioned. Second week is full of complications. They can have deafness and mucal, but most characteristic, what I want to share is the presence of ARDS, non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So acute febrile illness in the second week, patient going for ARDS, 
possibility of uh, uh, scrub typhus should be thought of. Again, that is one of the very good disease to treat. We give intravenous doxycycline and patient responds very nicely. So early administration of doxycycline is really a life-saving drug. Patient comes out and just walks out of IMCU. So this is a characteristic complications, but if picked up early, can be managed well. It can cardiac and other things can be there. It can cause multi-organ dysfunctions also. Response to doxy and macrolids. If they are resistant, maybe with rifampicin. So the final case will go to the another important life-threatening acute febrile illness. If not diagnosed, can go in for a multi-organ dysfunction. A 20-year-old laborer coming from Bihar, working in Coimbatore, has come to emergency department with history of altered sensorium, history of breathlessness, and he gives history treatment some in private setup before coming to near. Uh, uh, in an altered sensorium with severe respiratory. So one of the possibility is we have to rule out the uh, ILI and uh, I was mentioning about influenza like illness. Since he has coming from Bigar, where falciform malaria is a well known, please keep that in mind. So you have a classical fever, chills and dry gut. Apart from that, they can have respiratory symptoms when they go for uh, complications. So I'll just quickly go through the treatment. So we always classify as Vivax. As far as our state is concerned, still Vivax is the most common case and we can treat with chloroquine and primaquine. But again, when it comes to uncomplicated falciparum, still it's a, they say it's one of the diseases where we can cure the patient in three days. Day one with artesanate and sulfadoxime and pyrethamine. Day two, you give artesanate and primaquine and artesanate on the third day. So three diseases, we can give a clearance. But critical thing is the complicated falciparum malaria, where again, we have to give a parenteral uh, artusnate or artithimer, or still we are very comfortable in quinine. Quinine also can be given. Follow-on treatment is, that is, we call it as ACT. Artusnate combination therapy is very, very important. Again, we mentioned about a particular patient coming with altered sensorium and breathlessness. So these are the well-known complications of cerebral uh, malaria in the form of coma, hyperpyrexia, convulsions, hypoglycemia, especially when you are using Q9 and all, they are highly prone. Again, acute pulmonary edema, renal shutdown and bleeding and DIC-like picture. Again, they can have hyperparacetamia. That is one of the good diseases to treat with artusnate. The first dose of artusnate can clear the parasites. And just like treating hypoglycemia, you can see the immediate response of uh, hyperparacetamia being treated with artusnate. Patient's consciousness improves. And of course, metabolic acidosis. So I will not go to the, I will just uh, to conclude, fever management is always a challenge. Why? It will continue to so because today we are seeing, you know, practice a lot of emerging and re-emerging uh, diseases and especially on One Health concept. Today, WHO has come out with One Health, where human health, animal health, and environmental health has to be addressed together. You name an animal, it can carry a zoonotic. In fact, in our infectious disease, 60 to 70% of our diseases are zoonotic in origin. So these are the emerging challenges that we come across in our practice. No longer any disease is seasonal. Anytime we can come across, across boundaries we are coming across, most often, we more than 30-40% of infections are more than one. And AMR, antimicrobial resistance, is going to be a difficult challenge. And I already mentioned about emerging and re-emerging. And safety of healthcare providers and patients. Press and media, again, for any disease, marma kachal, immediately they flash it and educating the public. So I would like to conclude as far as AFI is concerned. No inadi, no mudal nadi, aditanikkum. Mostly it is viral, it can be bacterial based on clinical diagnosis, based on good history and supported by a good appropriate laboratory investigation, we can make a diagnosis and treat the patients. Thank you for our attention. Sir, thank you, sir. Uh, sir, there was an exhaustive and uh, uh, educative lecture, sir, uh, particularly the take-home message. Uh, now, I think uh, we are running out of time and I think uh, I'll request the last speaker uh, of the day. It's always uh, tough to be the last speaker coming in the first and talking last. So I request Dr. Suresh Kumar, sir, to get ready with his presentation. Uh, Suresh Kumar, sir.
Can you share your screen, sir? Suresh Kumar, sir. Suresh Kumar, sir. So let me reach out to him, sir. I'll call him, sir. Yeah, 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 sir. So in the meantime, I would like to say that there are many questions coming up. So we'll keep the question answer session to the last after the last speaker speaks, and uh, you can just post your questions, and uh, we'll coordinate and ask them the questions. And one more thing, there are many questions regarding how to join this uh, CGP courses and uh, how to join IMA CGP. For that, I would I will I'll do a screen sharing of uh, the contact numbers of the uh people office people at the state ima and also i'll also share the uh, registration uh, certificates at the end of this uh, session so that you can have a look into it sir sir is not made as a co-host uh, sir is not made as a co-host sir ama sir i uh, suresh sir unmute panni id solunga sir no no Sir, you are a co-host, no, sir, Mohan, sir. I am a co-host, sir, yes, sir. Oh, yeah, okay, you can add him, no, sir. No, I cannot add, sir, because I am still, still a co-host. I think uh, Sindhil has to die. Sir, Sindhil is unmuted, sir. So, Suresh, sir, you can share your slides with me in the WhatsApp. Okay, in the I can, meantime, I'll introduce uh, Suresh, sir, Ramon, uh, sir. So, Suresh, yes, sir, 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 is an MD General Medicine and FNB in Infectious Disease from American Certified Tropical Medicine course and fellow uh, in HIV and AIDS medicine. He's the co-founder of uh, Best of uh, IDs, Simply, Simplify ID, and is also a senior consultant in Infectious Disease at Apollo Hospitals, Chennai. So, he has uh, many uh, credentials to his name. An Young Investigator Award from International AIDS Society in 2007. Uh, Professor S.K. Rajan Gold Medal uh, at the Apicon 2015. Uh, he uh, is an expertise in tropical infections, nosocomial infections, transplant and HIV infections. Uh, he has more than 40 so international national so. publications. And now I think uh, he is sharing his screen. Yes, sir. Pray, sir. Yeah, yes, sir. Can you able yes, to see? Sir. Now you are audible, sir. Now you can, yes. sir. We'll... Okay. I think Thank both you, my previous speakers has almost like I finished whatever we need to talk. But even though it's a prolonged illness, I'm going to simplify whatever things they told initially. I'm going to summarize initially in the next couple of uh, minutes only there. So those who are interested, yes, you can stay together and learn it. So there are around 16 people still yeah, waiting for the year election. Yeah, sir. no problem, sir. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. So I sincerely thank the IMA and like CGP for providing wonderful opportunity and particularly Dr. Neminathan, Dr. Raghunandan, our IMA President, Secretary and CGP members for giving this wonderful opportunity. Uh, so this is my disclosures. I'm an ID physician. We are not making big money, but definitely we solve a lot of problems and we uh, get happiness by solving the problem only. And this uh, WhatsApp like chat we are creating for those who are joining this fellowship so that we can provide uh, immediate support for fever cases those who are staying now so this is a benefit for you people there so if you want to get an immediate opinion from your patient query related thing this is a chatbot run by an id doc that can help you what to solve and what not to solve that's for more important before i start here i'm just going to start on poll questions i just want to see how many out of 608 is present actively now do you like to get a second opinion for your fever patients based on a whatsapp chatbot for id opinion so I'm just standing the poll. So people go ahead and vote. How many say, yes, I like to get them. You need to, QR code is not appearing. Yeah, sorry. Unfortunately, the QR code is not appearing. Okay. So we just go and see how many say, put it in a chat box. If suppose if you get in uh, a chat bot for your clinical services, suppose you got a chat bot can answer. That is run by an ID doc. Whether you're interested to get an opinion from ID doc through the chat bot, please go ahead and vote. Say, yes, I want to get the opinion. No, I'm not interested. Maybe if the chatbot is interesting again. So just go ahead and vote. I thought of putting it in the chatbot, but unfortunately it's not burning the sure. Sorry. 
So before you say, I, have, I am starting to see more, more than 60, 70 yes responses, sir. Thank you, sir. Thanks for a wonderful responses, sir. Thank you. Okay. So what I'm going to do is basic steps in the fever approach. Already my previous speaker saluted. What are all the tricks and tips on I'm going to elude now? What investigations to do and what investigations not to do? And how to manage a fever patients and summary and way forward I'm going to suggest you. This is my approach today because everybody sees all cases of fever. So straight away begin with the case instead of waiting till the end. This is a case already my previous speaker saluted. So this is a post test for you. Can you answer this question? 28 year old male working in Chennai, fever of eight days durations. He has also got diarrhea four days durations. On examinations, febrile spleen was present. What is more interesting, he has got a similar past medical history in the last two months, taken some antibiotic, improved immediately. Now treated with five days of antibiotics with no responses. He's getting now levofloxacin, but the patient is not moving forward. He's native of Trichy, but working in Chennai. What is your diagnosis? So please go ahead and vote again in the chat column so that we can discuss. I'm going to see the chat box now. How many says malaria? How many says typhoid, dengue, lepto, TB? start the PUO or JUO. But by the way, the JUO is called germ of unknown origin. When the fever is lasting more than seven days, when you did some basic investigations that is not showing any response, you need to know what to do. That's most important for you. So I'm seeing Hello? the yes, uh, credits only. I'm, I like to get some feedback from the participants. Really? Participants are leaving, but no problem. Just answer and leave. Yeah. So typhoid patients, resistant type, entric people, so my previous speakers has done a good job there so that we can have some discussions towards the end. I'll come back and explain. We'll sort out these cases a little bit later. So what I'm going to do right now, yeah. So approach to fever, the first and foremost important thing. Unfortunately, this is what's not taught in our medical school. When you encounter your patients, whether it's a fever patient or any other patients, what is the first step? Whether the patient is stable enough for you to examine further or the patient needs hospitalizations, or the patient needs admissions or close monitoring, that is the first thing you need to do. How to do it? Just check the vital parameter. If the patient has got conscious, able to give the history to the pulse rate, when the pulse rate is more than 100, second thing is the respiratory rate. When the respiratory rate is more than 22, when the patient has got tachypnea, when the patient has got systolic BP less than 100 or 90 millimeters of mercury, when the patient is not able to give clear history, that patient is not stable. So don't try to examine the patient. Don't try to ask history there. First thing, stabilize the patients. Unless you stabilize the patients, you can't figure out there. So in any cases of fever, the first and foremost thing is we need to know whether the patient is stable for further history and examination. That is the most important thing. That's what you need to do. That's a basic step also. Whether the patient is a septic, shocky, or the patient is a stable for you in the OP. The next question is people come on telling me I got two months fever. I got six months fever. But if you see the patient, the patient is quite stable to you. The patient is giving a clear history. The patient is loud enough to speak. That point of time, I really doubt whether the patient has got fever or not. Then I ask immediately, what is the temperature? He says 98, 96. So we need to know whether the patient has got really fever. Even though the patient says I got two months fever, three months fever, what you really need to know whether the patient has got fever. So what is the simplest way? Ask him to record. People ask whether I can record a oral temperature, axillary temperature, whatever temperature consistent in one particular point and check and maintain the chart. We need to maintain it three times minimum, morning, afternoon, night. That is more important. But there are certain exceptions. Some people, they don't have fever. Who are all the people? Elderly people, neonates. They can't expect fever for neonates to happen. People on immunosuppressed and neutropenic don't expect. People taking steroids. Don't expect they will mount a fever. So we need to know the limitations of the fever, but we need to elicit a proper history and examine. Ask him to record. Either you can record your clinic or ask the people to record and show. Most of the people, they say fever, but when you ask what is the temperature, 98. People say, I got warm by touching the skin surface. That is one of the... Suresh, sir. Yes, sir. Suresh, sir. The slides are not moving. So I can you reshare the show. Okay. We're second. still in the title slide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Sorry. Um, it is, we have seen the slide, not the uh, slide show. Yeah. Can you make the slide show? Okay. Now we are able to see? Now we are able to see, sir? No, I cannot see the slide show because you have to stop and then share the show slide show. Stop sharing. Yeah. Or you can just go with the non-show slides. One second. 
now we are, now we are in... seeing the ninth ninth slide sir ninth slide sir but uh, still if you go to slide show it is not coming it is in the view one second sir let's stop yes. and yeah stop and reshare the show yeah, first two minutes. two minutes yes i understand just most of them are not seen now we are able to see sir now i can see does this patient have fever but yeah. not in the slideshow mode. But you can go with this this uh, this alone sir, straight away. Okay, sir. Because I do not know because I did properly only. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. Okay. So you need to verify the fever. That's most important for you. And second thing, certain dictums in the fever. When the fever lasts more than seven days, don't put your money on viral fever. Don't put your money. Usually, viral fever lasts for three to five days, maximum seven days. Sometimes it behaves as a biphasic fever, but most of the viral fever by day 7 will subside. So any fever more than 7 days, don't think even though dengue IgM positive, dengue IgG positive. When the fever lasts more than 7 days, very few viral fever, for example, mononucleosis, very few fevers can last more than 7 days. Otherwise, when the fever lasting more than 7 days, don't put your money on virus. That's most important thing. So we need to know when to suspect viral fever and when not to suspect viral fever. Why it is important? If you think viral fever, there's no need for antibiotics. That is most important. Almost all the leading like a faculty today, they told, if you think antibiotic, antibiotic stewardship is a big challenge for every clinicians. So if you write viral fever, don't write antibiotic. That is most important for you. How to suspect viral fever? The fever is three to five days in durations. Sharp onset, usually young individual, Think of viral fever. If it lasts more than seven days, even though the test come back as dengue hygiene positive, don't think about it. So this is a paper. This paper was done in Chennai. We had demonstrated most of the fever, particularly the fever lasting for two to three days. The commonest reason is viral fever. Without any interventions, without any antibiotic, just give symptomatic therapy, the patients recover. So this is what the guideline says and this is what the evidence also says. This is a small uh, secondary level hospital. They demonstrated for a fever come to the OP or come to the emergency, they ask and try to look for any severity. For example, the septic shock or shock, what I told, nothing is present. Patient is stable, walking, talking. Most of the fever subsides on its own. Only thing we need to wait and watch. So less than five days, healthy persons, no comorbid, stable, just absorb the fever, give some symptomatic therapy, the patient will start improving well. So coming back to this case, what is your diagnosis now? So this is not five days fever. This is not seven days fever. So definitely don't put your diagnosis of dengue here. So the remaining diagnosis only, or you want to put a germ of unknown origin uptake. So what are you going to do now? So what is your thought process? I want to check the chat bot again. So how many people are answering malaria to ruled out? Okay. I'll come back to the malaria part. That's very important thing. So right now I am... Sorry, in sir, the slide is not still moving, sir. You're in which slide, sir, numbers? I'm in Nagar 28 again showing the same thing what I shown initially there. Right now you are moving, sir. sir. No, it's not moving. So can you do no, an sir. escape? No, you do one thing, sir. Can you run the show? Because Nagar, I did it. I do not know. So one second. I, 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 share I, my I am screen. doing, sir. One I'm second, doing. sir. One second. I'll try my last attempt. If it is not working, you start sharing, sir. Sure, sir. Sure, sure. Right now it's okay, sir. It's moving. Is it no. moving? No, sir. I think like something is my <laughs> part, sir. No, no, no sir, can I, you do it, sir. sir. I can do it. Which and like both Dr. Sendhil, sir, as well as Dr. Mohan, sir. Mohan, sir. Slide show, which slide, sir? Uh, you, you, I sent it through WhatsApp. No, which slide, sir? Number. No, no, slide number. Yeah, like slide number. number. 12, sir. Number 12. Number 12. Okay. I'm doing that, sir, now. Yeah. Okay. Thank I can you. Stop sharing. You can start sharing. I, I am I'm going to share, sir. Yeah. I stop, stop sharing, sharing yeah. Sure. No problem, sir. Yeah, over to you. Yeah. So yeah. So previous slides, sir. Sorry. Previous one. Yeah. So the diagnosis depends upon the proper history taking. My previous speaker alluded on this point. For example, this patient is from Pondicherry. He he was visiting Togo. That's in West African country. Working as an electric electronic engineer. Came back three weeks back. And he has not taken vaccination. This is a history people usually take. But as an ID doc, infectious disease doc, oh, I need to take a history. Next slide, please. This is how I take the history. Three weeks back, he came from Togo. He worked as a telecom engineer for four months, not taken any vaccinations, no drugs before during travel. He was not on any profile access, staying in a hair conditioned room, not participated in any outdoor activity or recreational activities, not eaten any street food. 
no sex, no barefoot walking. On return state, during return travel, he stayed close to the airport in a place where there is no air conditions and there is no bed nets also. So the patient is towards coming. He stayed almost three months or four months in Togo where he does not get any infections because he stayed in a well uh, air conditioned rooms with the bed net. But we're coming back because of the airport is very far away. He took on one place and stayed in the close to the airport, but there is no AC, there is no bed net. So what happened? The cystic gives a clue the patient is suffering from malaria. So this is how the infectious disease is still goes away. So we need to take in detail what you did, where you went, what you had eaten, what sort of food you are taking, whether you did sex, whether you swim, whether you have taken any drugs, and what is your profile access. You should be digging the history more. If you dig the history, you can get the answer. Next one, sir. So this is called the PO history or JO history. What is the history of transitions? Any tattoo, any surgeries, what antibiotic? What personal history? Smoking, drinking, vegetarian, because B12 deficiency, one of the common cause of fever, that also causes purely seen in the presence of vegetarian patients. History of HIV, any sexual exposures, any over-the-counter medications, alcohol abuse, any recent infections, what antibiotic you have taken. So this is how the history should be elicited to figure out PUO. PO is not a magic thing there. PO does not require any major investigations. If you take a proper history for PO, you can sort out the PO most of the patients. Next one, sir. So this is what clearly told. The differences between a good clinician and indifferent clinician is the time spent on history taking. If I saw a first time on PO case, I need to spend minimum 20 to 30 minutes to figure out what is going on. Infectious disease dogs, nothing do. We are doing nothing major. We sit to the patients, we elicit the patients, we dig the history and we find out the answers. We are not doing anything great. Only thing I'm spending time. I'm spending more time with the patients. I'm digging the history, what my previous clinicians missed out. My previous clinicians elicited, failed to elicit the history. I'm going to elicit the history. I'm getting the answer. So I need to dig the history proper so that I can get the answer. If you spend a lot of time with the patients, Getting the history, proper history, that's most important thing. You'll get the answer in PEO. So solving PEO is not a major thing. Solving PEO does not require any major investigations. Sit, dig history, that's most important and first and foremost important thing. Next slide. So in real life, what happened? Patients giving history, but unfortunately, we don't have time to listen. We want to cut short and we want to look for something else, but we are missing the history. So if the patient is telling the history, we need to listen to the history, but proper history. Some patients agree. They can distract you. They can tell a lot of nonsenses. They don't talk properly. Either. That's fine. But we need to know how to guide the conversations and get the history proper, what I need. That's the heart. That will come with the experiences only that we can learn during our course of PO cases handling it there. But what happened most of the time, we ignore the history and we try to cut short by doing some investigations, getting some papers saying dengue IgM positive, lepto IgM positive. We think that's the diagnosis we made. That's the biggest mistake we are doing in our practice. Next one. So this is a coming back to the same case. How I did the thing? This is a clue. This is an young individual. Most of the time people are talking about typhoid, typhoid. But what is a clue for typhoid? The person should be young individual most of the time. Above the age of 40, happening typhoid is less likely to me. Staying away from home, he's richy but in Chennai, eating most of the time outside food. So I ask what sort of food is favorite? He's eating Pani Puri. The patient has got eating Pani Puri most of the time. Whichever food is not cooked, not boiled, not peeled. If he's eating, the chances of typhoid is more likely. That is a history for him. Received short courses of antibiotic. When a patient receiving a short course of antibiotic, fever improves, again getting back only three possibility. One is a typhoid that's partially treated. Two, tuberculosis. For example, you're using drug like levofloxacin, linozolid. The patient improves again getting back because only partial drug cover. Third thing is infective endocarditis. Again, you're not treating properly. Short course of antibiotics may fail. Then fourth and fourth was thing, abscess, occult abscess that may improve transiently and again failing back. So these are all the four history, four differential diagnoses. When a patient's improve with the antibiotics, again getting back means either the patient has got typhoid partially treated, two tuberculosis, inappropriate drug like levofloxacin, linozolid. Third thing, the patient has got infective endocarditis. The fourth thing is called occult abscess. When a fever crosses more than seven days durations, young individual eating outside food and bowel disturbances, either in the form of diarrhea or constipations, put your money on typhoid. Next slide, sir. So this is how we make a diagnosis. This is how the history should be there. So we need to make a diagnosis of typhoid based upon the history. So my second case here, this is a 42-year-old male again from Tiruvallur. 15 days of fever, back pain, body pain, headache. 
consecutive insufficiency completed on course of chloroquine. People giving malaria as a differential diagnosis, think about it. Take in cefixime. This time, no travel with cefixime of four, five days, no improvement. Total WBC count was elevated, 13,100. Polymorphs predominant, platelets were a bit low. LFT showed elevated bilirubin. Vidal is 1 in 160, HDR is positive. Dengue hygiene is positive. So what will you do now? Take a detailed history. So please go ahead and what I can see the responses. Add anti-malarial. Maybe Dr. Mohan or Dr. Sindhil can help me. Which choice people are choosing now? Take a detailed history. Add anti-malarial. Trial of TB medicines. CT chest and abdomen. Cultures, all of the above. People say leptospirosis because typhoid is discussed in length and breadth, so it cannot be typhoid. But people say leptospirosis could take a detailed history. So my point is conveyed in the previous case. But you are taking cefixime. Despite cefixime, patient has got fever, you are taking leptospirosis. That's why the drug history is more important. Cefixime will work for leptospirosis. Don't think crystalline benzene. My previous speaker clearly told not only the crystalline benzene, third generation cephalosporins, doxycycline, acetromycin, everything will work for leptospirosis. So take a history only. So what history people want to know, I need to know a little later. So don't want to give trial of TB medicines, trial of anti-malarial. I'm looking for anti-malarial, but nobody's putting anti-malarial. But in real practice, when the fever crosses more than seven days, even though malarial parasite negative, people tell the patients, this is malaria, take malarial medications. I've seen so many prescriptions. We do prescriptions already. We have seen a lot of anti-malarial. So next slide, please. Next slide, please. So previous antibiotic history is more important. When a patient taken cephalosporins for more than five days, still fever is persisting. Lepto is unlikely. Typhoid, again, chances are a bit low. When the person taken doxycycline for more than three days, still fever is going on. What is not likely? Lepto is unlikely. Streptyphus is unlikely. Typhoid is possible. Doxycycline is not a good drink for typhoid. The person taken azithromycin, typhoid, lepto, scrub, everything ruled out. Ofloxacin, leofloxacin, anything is possible. Nowadays, ofloxacin, leofloxacin, resistance is very high. So still typhoid can be possible. Still streptyphus is possible. Even lepto is also possible. This is a partial drug for everything. So the bottom line, fluoroconol is not a good drug. If you use fluoroconolone, the fever may go down initially, but it can persist longer time. Antibiotic fever subsided again coming back. I told three things. Yeah, the TB, typhoid, occult abscess, infected endocarditis. Chloroquine fever subsided. Think of autoimmune disease and viral diseases. Don't think this is malaria. People always mistaken chloroquine. That's malaria. No naproxen or naproxen we can call. That is because of auto-inflammations, autoimmunity or malignancy. Or this is a reason when the naproxen can release the fever. Next slide, sir. So the previous antibiotic history is the most important thing. So what is the history here? The patient is from rural background. No response to cephic sign. Patient has got fever of more than 15 days durations. As far as I think, I try to localize any system, whether the system belongs to brain or lung or abdominal system or urinary tract, this is, does not belong to any system to me. So the patient is a 40-year-old male from rural background, fever lasting more than 15 days, absolutely no response to chloroquine and cephic sign. So where is the lesions? The patient is most probably what I need to do. I elicited the history. He's basically farming activity is doing, exposed to the uh, bushy areas because he's living in a Thiruvallur in an individual house, not a flat. It's a lot of bushy areas is surrounding. Any thought process now? Leptospirosis, I'm telling. Leptospirosis is not possible. The patient has taken cefixime. Cefixime is a good drug. There is no resistance to leptospirosis to cefixime, third generation cephalospirin. Now people are thinking and answering that. Good. Go ahead. Next slide. So what we need to do, elicit a proper history and do a physical examinations. Head to toe, we used to call head to toe. Look for the eyes, particularly set conjunctival suffusions I need to see. Look for any hectares. Look for any uh, hemorrhagic spots. Again, GCS in the head, thyroid we need to see, breast, axillary node, cervical node, vitals for assess the severity of the patients. Murmurs, we need to look for it, liver and spleen and fluid, genital, that's most important. We need to look for devices, peripheral line. The patient is in hospital, develop fever, think about antibiotic diarrhea, think about thrombophilbitis. Thrombophilbitis is one of the commonest cause or pressure sore. The patient may have pressure sores. How sick is the patient's and organ failure, that's most important. Pedal edema as well as erythema nodosum type of lesions I need to see. So this is a detailed physical examination, not courtesy or not superficial examinations. So you need to do a detail. One, eliciting a proper history. Two, do a proper physical examination. Next slide, please.
So we need to do the focused examination. Since the patient is from rural background, taken suffix sign, there's no improvement. He's working as a farmer, exposed to a lot of bushy areas in the house. My diagnosis is strep typhus because the WBC count is elevated, plated is a bit low. Typhoid, the chances of platelet dropping to 80,000 is very unlikely. Similarly, in typhoid, the WBC count going 30,000 is unlikely. So this is mostly Lyme disease is not seen in India. There's no uh, vector, there's no uh, tick that's called like a Lyme disease tick is not present. So this is like a strep typhus. Next slide, please. When I examine the patients, strip the patients, examine the patients, this is the area people don't examine. This is called the area of jetty, where we're using our undergarments. So when you see this black necrotic part, this is called the hishkar. Usually males, it is present below the umbilicus. Why? When you're wearing a tight garment, the mite climbs your body. Where the moisture is present, the mite goes and bite. So for male, it is below umbilicus. For female, it is above, above umbilicus, particularly in the axilla and the breast. So we need to strip the patients, examine the patients. Female patients below the breast and axilla and male patients below the umbilicus, I need to examine for a black necrotic thing. That is the clutch. If you find out there is no need for any further investigations, there's no need for any CD scans, there's no need for any PET CD. So how I make the diagnosis of strep typhus? I do a detailed proper examinations. So the first thing in PO, whether the patient is stable or not. Second, confirm the fever. Third thing, do a proper history taking. Fourth thing is by doing a proper physical examinations. History give the clue. Rural background, exposed to the bushy areas, and the patient is still having fever despite suffix sign. I put my money on it. Next one, please. So this is the area we need to examine. Male patients always examine below the umbilicus area. Female patients always above the umbilicus area. That's Below the breast or below the armpit, we need to examine the patients. So this is a clue where to examine. This is called the focused examinations. Depending upon the clue, I need to search for it. So where to search, that's most important. Next one, please. So most of the time, people not elicit, but at the same time, not examining also. That is most difficult thing. We need to elicit proper history, otherwise examine the patients properly. If you fail to do both the things, PO is a real PO for you. If you do properly, PO is nothing for you. So keep in mind proper history examinations and do your physical examinations. Next slide, please. So the approach to FEO at the end of the history taking and end of the physical examinations, we need to know where is the problem. Whether the patient has got some syndromic approach, whether a particular organ is affected or fever without any source, that is what needed. So why no fever control with the doxycycline ready? The patient was not taken doxycycline. The patient was taken cefixime. But cefixime is not a drug for strep typhus. Here the patient has not started doxycycline. The patient was taken cefixime. Somebody put it in the chat box. That's why I'm answering. So at the end of your history taking and at the end of physical examinations, we need to know whether the patient has got sick, shocky or not. Second thing, the patient has got fever or not. Third thing, where is the fever? Whether specific organ is affected or there is no organ is affected. For example, in this case, there is no organ is affected. The patient has got diffuse manifestations. So at that point of time, we need to know whether the organ is affected means my approach is entirely different. Next slide, please. First thing, you need to write a diagnosis. If you write a diagnosis at the end of your history and end of your physical examination, write a professional diagnosis. This is an acute undifferentiated fever or the patient has got prolonged fever, or the patient has got pyrexia of unknown origin, or the patient has got urinary tract, the patient has got meningosyncephalitis, the patient has got pneumonia. So write the syndrome. Think like a STD physicians. STD physicians never write, they got, uh, they don't, never write syphilis, they never write gonorrhea, they never write chlamydia. What they write? Genital ulcer, genital, uh, genital swelling, genital ulcer, genital discharge. That's what we need to do. That's what we need to do so that we can be able to figure out what is going on. So first thing, write a diagnosis. How to write the diagnosis? Next slide, please. That will tell how to write the diagnosis. So put together your symptoms and signs. For example, the patient has got fever, headache, seizures, the weakness. Think about brain. Brain means meningitis, meningoencephalitis, fever, running nose, sneezing, throat pain, upper respiratory tract. If you say the patient has got sore throat, the patient has got hoarseness of voice, either pharyngitis or pharyngolaryngitis. Fever, cough, shortness of breath. So fever, cough, shortness of breath. Think about it. That is caused pneumonia. Fever, dysuria, urgency, lower abdominal pain, UTI. The patient has got fever, upper UTI, pyelonephritis. Patient does not have fever, only burning maturations, urgency, lower UTI. Patient has got fever, swelling, redness of the skin, pain, tenderness, cellulitis. This is how we need to write a diagnosis. 
So try to figure out whether the patient has got particular syndrome or not. At the end of year, we still taking in physical examinations. That's what more important. Next slide, please. People asking about ideal antibiotics and ideal things that we'll discuss in the end. So this is a 62-year-old male, diabetic, interstitial lung disease, 20 days fever. For the ILD, he has taken a lot of steroids. Dry cough, no weight loss of 4 kilograms. This is bread and butter for everybody. Taken on and off steroids for underlying ILD. Sugar is poorly controlled. He used to consume alcohol one month back. So what do you think? What will you do now? Detailed history. Mainly drug history I want to examine. No detailed examinations. Sputum AB smear times 2. Sputum CB NAD. Trial of TB medicines. Refer. So what do you do? It's interesting stuff. I like to see the responses. Please go ahead and vote. 62-year-old male, diabetic, interstitial lung disease, poorly controlled diabetic, drug history. The patient so far taken paracetamol, patient taken hazithromycin. Any other takers or any other want to answer this one? Detailed history. This is a detailed history. No travel. He's an alcoholic but stopped last 15 days. Any other history wanted? Drug history has taken paracetamol. 5. Sputum CB NAT. Okay, TB. You are smelling the TB. Good. Very good. Next slide, please. Go ahead. Next slide, please. So this is a CT scan they did. Man 2, they did 20 by 20. So what do you do now? CB NAT is like a man 2 test is showing 20 by 20. Cavitatory lesions in the CT scan. So you want to do CB NAT or you want to start TB medicines now? Please go ahead and vote. I'll discuss a couple of minutes in this slide. This is a very interesting stuff for you. Cavitatory lesions, diabetic host. So they want to do still CB NAT. People want to start trial ADT. Very good. Start trial ADT. Okay. Good. Next slide, please. People smelt, but they did the bronchoscopy. Sorry, previous slide. Previous one, sorry. Yeah. So they did the bronchoscopy. Since the patient is having a dry cough, not able to produce a sputum, sputum examination is not possible. So we did the bronchoscopy. In the bronchoscopy specimen, the CB net tend to be negative. How many say this is TB now? The bronchoscopy can miss out. This is TB only. Manto is positive, cavitated pneumonia. What else? This is TB only, smelling TB. Whether you want to start TB medicines, still TB, trial of ATT. People want to start trial. Okay, good. Next one, please. Next slide, please. So this case, what will you do now? The patients, next slide, please. Keep clicking, sir. Next ah. So this is the investigations. Can you figure out what is the diagnosis now? Your white all is negative. We thought about typhoid. Based upon the history I told, the patient has got eating outside, staying in Chennai, away from Trichy, all sorts of food is eating. Fever is lasting more than seven days, but the patient has taken leofloxacin, but no response. So this is the investigation, Jan, February, and March. The WBC count is normal. Differential count is normal. Vidal is negative. First time it was not done. Second time it was negative. So for this case, what are going to do? People talking about aspergillus, net culture is required. So what are going to do now? Leptospira hygiene is positive. We are not putting our money on leptospirosis. Keep clicking, sir. Next click. So, what is your diagnosis? No, no, please, one, sir. Yeah, what is your diagnosis now? I give it lepto. So, once you got the lepto report, people say lepto. In infectious disease, don't treat the people. The serological test always take with pinch of salt, not pinch of salt, tablespoon of salt you need to take. So, don't take reporting leptospirosis. Because as I told, levofloxacin is not an ideal type for leptospirosis, but compared to typhoid, compared to scrub typhus, leptospirosis, it may work. Despite taking levofloxacin, the patient is still suffering. And why the leptospirosis keep happening? This person is not walked in the rainwater, not bathed in the rainwater. There is no exposure to the rain. How the leptospirosis is going to come to you? You need to walk in the rainwater, bathe in the rainwater. But unfortunately, the person is not walked in the rainwater, not bathed in the rainwater. Why the person getting leptospirosis? So this is what, don't go with the lab reports. How to know the lab reports is most important. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Ah. So this is the slide. So the patient has got zero to three days. There's no need for any investigation. That's what the paper I told. When a patient has got zero to three days, healthy persons, no comorbid, there is no need for any specific treatment. Just absorb this and symptomatic therapy will be all right. When a patient is lasting more than three to seven days, one CBC LFT may give you a clue. More than seven days, blood culture is needed. What are all the tests you should not do? Man 2. Never do Man 2. Never do Man 2. White all is useless test. Never do white all. Single white all. Never do lepto mat. Think about leptospirosis. When a patient is walking through the rainwater, you can start. One bottle of blood culture has got no use, particularly 2 ml, 3 ml, never put. 
urine cultures without urine routine test. These are all tests has got no value. Do not do single vidal. Never do mantle to diagnose active TB. Leptospirosis, MAT or MSAT, no role. One bottle of blood cultures, 2 ml, no role. Urine cultures without urine routine, absolutely no role. Next slide, please. So this is a simple algorithm. And the WBC count is normal. Think possibility of viral versus typhoid. When the hemoglobin is elevated, concentrated in dengue, when the hemoglobin is bit low, think about the diagnosis of, think about diagnosis, MT positive indicate latent TB, correct answer, dead. So when a patient has got hemoglobin elevated, think of dengue along with normal WBC or below normal WBC. If you see the differential count, lymphocyte predominant, platelet is bit low, too low, put your money on dengue. And see the LFT, SGOT elevated, SGPT more elevated. OT is elevated more compared to PT, dengue. Suppose a patient has got typhoid, hemoglobin may be normal. Total count may be normal or below normal. Differential count, try to see the eosinophil count. Eosinophenia, that is a marker of typhoid. Provided the patient is an young individual eating outside food, there is no need for blood cultures. Similarly, OTPT will be elevated. SGPT is elevated more in typhoid compared to OT. And similarly, the LFT may be normal. Leptospirosis, hemoglobin may be normal, WBC count elevated. Differential count neutrophilic, not like lymphocytic. Platelet is low, not like dengue, slightly low. OTPT and alkaline phosphorase, both are elevated. Malaria nowadays I am not saying because now the EDS mosquito overtaken anaphylus. So anaphylus is a bit low. So don't think malaria, malaria, malaria is almost gone. And the malaria smear is negative. I never given an empirical anti-malaria. So hemoglobin is below normal. Differential WBC code may be below normal. Differential code monocytes can go up. Platelets can go down. OTPT may be slight elevations or alkaline phosphorase can go up. So this is a simple chart. Now go back and see previous two slides. Sir. Previous slides, previous slides, not after slides. Sir. Previous. See the chart. See the chart. See the differential count. WBC count is normal. Where is the eosinophil? Eosinophil is missing. So you can put the patient has got eosinophenia. This is a marker of typhoid. This is a marker of typhoid to me. Don't rely on Vidal. Vidal is a useless test. Next slide, please. Next slide, yeah. So Vidal is a test of historical interest. Never do Vidal in a practice to make a diagnosis of typhoid because Vidal has got a lot of false positive. Dengue can cause false positive. Once a patient has got previously typhoid, it remains lifelong also. So we do not know how long it is going to be positive. A lot of things equally in the blood can cause false positive. Sometimes if you do early, it is negative. So we do not know Vidal is a very interesting test. Vidal is a test of historical interest. We never do Vidal. I practice as infectious disease for the last 15, 16 years, but I never, never did Vidal for making a diagnosis of typhoid. Please go ahead. Next one. Next slide, sir. So this is not, I'm telling, this is WHO. Single Vidal test has got no diagnostic significance in endemic region like India. Never do Vidal. I'm not telling. WHO is telling. Please go ahead. Whether it's light tube or tube method, whatever method has got no value. Single vital has got no value. Next slide, please. So ID secret is East Opinion, provided it's in a good lab. The lab should be good. This is not correlating in most of the poor labs I've seen. It's in a good lab, WBC count normal, neutrophil count normal, eosinophil count zero or maximum one, ESR normal. The four things should happen. Eosinophil count zero or one, WBC normal, neutrophil count normal, and eosinophil count zero or one, we think that is typhoid. We can predict typhoid based upon this rule, provided the patient is less than 40, eating outside food. Next slide. So this is our thing. So we sent eosinophenia in my hospital, 92% sensitivity. We put the paper, not a decade back. This is 93%. So please go ahead and see. Next slide. People want to see the version. So those who want to get certificates, stay till the end, so get the certificates. So choosing your right test. Malaria means peripheral smear. If your lab technician is good, do peripheral smear. If your lab technician is poor, do rapid card test. Both are equal. If the rapid card is negative or malaria smear is negative, essentially rules out malaria. Typhoid, the ideal thing is blood culture, but for a poor man, good WBC count with the eosinophil count. Scrub typhus by history is alone sufficient. Otherwise, we need to do scrub typhus PCR or IgM ELISA. Leptospirosis, again, culture, now PCR is available. Lepto has got PCR. Lepto IgM always take pinch of salt, otherwise good history, walking through the rainwater, wading through the rainwater. Influenza, always PCR, don't go with a rapid card test. Dengue, single blood, blood culture, single have to be weight. Repeat, no, usually if you do sufficient blood culture, that is fine. We'll discuss towards the end. Next slide, please. 
So for TB, ideal thing is CB net method. CB net is a good thing and along with AB culture. AB culture is mandatory. Don't send without AB culture. We see a lot of resistance to TB. HIV means fourth generation ELISA. Don't rely on rapid cut test alone. UTI means urinary symptoms, urine routine, urine culture. Acute gastroenteritis means we got a PCR test within one hour, we can find out 15 organisms, but unfortunately it's too costly. So these are all the tests and what are the tests we should not do? I clearly mentioned, my previous speaker also told the OVA cyst, whoever we experience, he cannot say whether it's entamoeba histolytica versus entamoeba nana. It's very difficult, our entamoeba dispar. Entamoeba dispar is a normal colonizer. You can't differentiate the cyst of Amoebic cyst from entamoeba histolytica with entamoeba dispar. That's not possible. Next slide, please. MG for TB diagnosis. That's what I'm talking about. TB diagnosis needs expert MTB, AB culture. The AB culture nowadays, we are doing liquid-based culture medium. That's called MG. So diabetic host, what will you do now? The patient is started trial of ADT as per the participant's advice. After starting TB medicines also, the person keeps clicking. So next slide, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Pagin, sir. Next slide. Next slide. So they started the ball round or previous one, sorry. Previous one. No, yeah. So the person's ball negative started trial ADT four weeks over. Despite giving a trial of ADT, the person is not improving. What do you think? How many say I want to start MDR treatment? Add streptomycin or fluoroquinolone like aminoglycosides. Follow AB culture and sensitivity. For that, you need to send the cultures. Do the therapeutic drug monitoring of ATTs. Continue trial ATT. Four weeks is too early. Wait for some more time to response. Or you want to join the ID fellowship next month. So get trained for TB. This is fungal pneumonia. People talking about fungal pneumonia. This is fungus. They are smelling. I think microbiologists are participating. They are saying it's fungus. Okay. Mycoplasma. Mycoplasma cavity pneumonia is very, very unusual presentations. But nobody wants to start MDR TB. Nobody wants to add streptomycin, aminoglycosides. Nobody? Okay, that's good. Next slide, please. So this is what happened. The person again started ceftriaxone and acetromycin. Despite starting ceftriaxone and acetromycin, the patient is not improving. What will you do? Ceftriaxone and acetromycin cover typhoid. Ceftriaxone and acetromycin cover leptospirosis also. But the patient is still fever. Day 5 is over. Day 5 of ceftriaxone, day 5 of acetromycin. Continue the same. Add empirical antimalarians or retake your history, re-examine. People always want to say fungus. For ID physicians, we need to say what fungus? Fungus is a bad word for me. So call the ID fellowship faculty. Easiest thing to do there. For that, you need to join the fellowship so that you can call the faculty now. Okay, great. So go ahead. Next slide, please. So whatever be the criteria, people say clinical malaria. There is no entity called clinical malaria. Fever, intermittent fever, chills and rigors. Fever, intermittent chills and fever, splenomegaly, only 50%. Toss a coin, head comes, a patient has got malaria, tail comes, a patient does not have malaria. So you cannot make a diagnosis of malaria, whatever experiences. You can suspect, but you can't confirm malaria. Next slide, please. Next. So the WHO is remote, please. Next slide, please. There is no entity called clinical malaria. Your patients can Google and find out this document says WHO saying there's no clinical malaria. If you write clinical malaria in a summary, discharge summary, the person can sue you in the court of law also. So keep in mind there's no entity called clinical malaria. Don't give empirical chloroquine. This is only when a patient is sick, shock and ICU conditions, one or two doses till the diagnosis is made. Next slide, please. So this is national drug policy in 2010. Previously, when I was doing my undergraduations, post-graduations, the policy, anybody come to fever, take smear, give chloroquine as a presumptive therapy. That's called presumptive treatment. But in 2010, government of India changed the policy. Presumptive therapy is not required. All malaria need to be proven unless otherwise. In 2010, I had never, never treated malaria as an empirical therapy. So far, this is what I'm doing. I never did the empirical therapy for anti-malaria. Next slide, please. So the guideline says in 2011, malaria should be confirmed with all means of either peripheral smear or rapid cut or MPQBC, but never give interval and empirical antimalarials. Empirical antimalarials is a bad word for malaria. Clinical malaria is not existing according to WHO. Please, next slide, please. 
So one of the first duty of physicians, according to Hostler, educate the mass, educate the patients not to take medicines, not to take anti-malarial, not to take chloroquine as an empirical therapy. This is what the first duty. This is a take-home message I can put for this slide. So never, never give chloroquine or any anti-malarial. Don't think the patient has got fever. My experience, this is malaria. Whatever your experience, this is not malaria to me. The next slide, please. So know the natural history. For example, typhoid case, even if you start appropriate antibiotics, ceftrioxone, acetylomycin, what is the timeline? It took minimum five to seven days for the fever to subside. So typhoid, the fever won't go in one day, two days. You need to wait. If you made a diagnosis of typhoid, please wait for five to seven days. Then only the fever will subside. Day four, the patient may be clinically better, but you need to wait. So this is called the natural history. Next slide, please. So this is our own paper. For salmonella typhi, the average time is 6.2 days. Salmonella paratyphi, the average time is 4.9 days. So we need to wait minimum 5 to 7 days for fever to subside. Don't expect the fever to go immediately. Once you made a diagnosis of typhoid, whether oral therapy, IV therapy, combination therapy, fever will last for 5 to 7 days. Any fever within 2 days, 3 days, the fever subsides, that is not typhoid. That's other indirect clue to me there. Next slide, please. So this case, what do you think? I write a syndrome because the patient has got fever, cough, patient is a diabetic and CT scoring cavity. This is a cavity related pneumonia in a diabetic host taking a lot of steroids. So the differential diagnosis is tuberculosis, but not all cavity belongs to TB. People say fungus. Fungus means think about aspergillus. That's fine. But it's most important, diabetic, poorly controlled diabetic, steroid taking. Next slide, please. I'll give the answer to you, this one. Next slide, please. The blood culture group, Burkholderia, pseudo, no, previous slide, please. So this is Burkholderia pseudomale, that's called milioidosis. So don't think when a patient has got cavity pneumonia, bronchoscopy, ball does not show CBNAT, always take pinch of the pinch of, you need to re revise your diagnosis. Don't think the patient has got tuberculosis. MAN2 has got no role. MAN2 will say latent TB alone. It won't say active TB. So don't start ATT based upon MAN2. MAN2 is a useless test for active TB. Only for latent TB, MAN2 is useful. So do not rely on the MAN2 to make a diagnosis. When a patient did a bronchoscopy, cavity lesions, when the bronchoscopy does not show expert MTB, we need to revise our diagnosis. This is a, not a simple host. Poorly controlled diabetic, alcoholic, lot of steroids. We need to think about fungus like aspergillus. We need to think about milia. We need to think about nocardia. We need to think about tuberculosis. These are all the things I need to come. So these are all the things I need to take. Next slide, please. So my summary, PUO, JUO, acute undifferentiated fever. Check the stability of the patients. Record the temperature. Take proper history. As an ID doctor, take a proper history. Do a detailed head-to-toe examinations. Investigate according to the clues and according to the basic investigations, what it gives an idea. Trial of anti-malarials, big no. In Chennai, for me, I have not seen a proven cases of malaria. All are imported cases. Either travel to Mumbai or southern part or somewhere outside travel, but not in proven Chennai because EDs is more compared to Hanophilus. ATD, after reasonably excluding other differential diagnosis, if there is no other option for you as a last resort, yes, you can consider. Keep in touch with ID doctors. You can get answers. How to keep in touch with ID doctors? Scan this QR code and fill this answer so that you can get answers. Suppose you got a difficult cases with this QR code will come a lot of questions. If you answer your questions about the patients, you will get the answer to the problem what you are solving. That's why I'm showing this slide. So if you want to get in touch with the ID doctor, please scan this QR code and keep in touch with us so that we can provide answer to you people. So this is what we need to do. So check the stability, take proper thing. What about filariasis? Filariasis is not going to cause that much fever. Unless secondary infections, filariasis won't cause fever. It can cause lymphedema is possible. It can cause lymphadenitis that is possible, but that don't cause PUO most of the time. Unless secondary infections. So those who want to get an ID opinion, free ID opinion, the scan will help. Next slide, please. So any questions about ID fellowship? Yes, we are open to it. Other fellowships are envying about ID fellowship, even though geriatric, everything is coming up. You need to wait for some more time. The next slide, please. So now you think, suppose you got a second opinion from ID doctor and WhatsApp bot. How many says, yes, I like to use the chat bot. This is free for me. I can use it. Please go ahead and vote. Almost 495 people are there. Say, what is your suggestions about the WhatsApp bot automatic chat bot? Yes. So please go ahead and vote so that we can work on this chat bot and provide people who want to enlighten them uh, things. We can happily provide the thing there. So please go ahead and vote. Thank you for the patient listening and thanks for the wonderful. Next slide, please.
Next slide. Yeah. So this is a QR code for your problem solving. And this is for the numbers you can approach us. And those who want to feel free to get the ID support, we are happy to provide you there. And those who want to learn, join the ID fellowship so you can provide excellent training. Those who want a hands-on training during the fellowship, come and learn with us what the ID doctor is doing. Feel free to contact us. Those who want to come on the weekends, those who want to spend one week or something there, happy we can provide the hands-on training, not the theoretical training. Please go ahead and get your hands-on training also. It is possible there. And those who completed previous fellowship, they want to refresh your knowledge, happen to free to contact us free to feel free to contact us thanks for the wonderful opportunity sorry my slide is not moving today unfortunately thanks for the wonderful opportunity there we are happy to take a couple of questions there. yeah thank you dr suresh kumar it was uh, really excellent and uh, you you brought in everything what the practitioner should know regarding the pyrexia for non origin almost uh, head to foot you touched everything so it was in a nutshell, and it was brief, it was very lucid, and I'm sure all the 500 doctors who attended this seminar got very, very valid, important points regarding PEO, and also short febrile illnesses in adult, and also related to pediatric fever and pediatric cases. So if there are any short questions, because time is around 7 p.m., now it's going to be 7. So if there are any one or two questions, we'll answer. Otherwise, we'll no, break up. Uh, Thank sir, you. Nadan, sir. Our, our, yeah. our uh, CGP representative, Dr. Suresh, is online. He is going yeah. to propose the order of thanks. I think he has some questions with him. Dr. Suresh? Yeah. Yes, sir. Suresh? Yeah. Suresh? Dr. Suresh? Yeah, Anand, if he is not there, you can propose the order. Thanks. If there are any okay, questions, sir. they can they can send it to us. Uh, yes, they sir. will answer yes, through WhatsApp. We'll we'll answer okay. through WhatsApp. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Uh, there was, uh, th th thank you. I, I would like to thank uh, the state IMA, our national dean, uh, Dr. Bora, sir, uh, and our president, secretary, treasurer, and uh, particularly the infectious team uh, uh, led by Dr. Nevinathan, sir. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Raghunandan sir and Dr. Suresh sir. Uh, so I think uh, we had a very exhaustive presentation and uh, the entire crowd, uh, it was, uh, even though it was a two hour session, it is now more than nearly to three hours and it's uh, around 500 people were there till the last moment. And total people who watched were around 750, the people who have registered. So this is a very good number and a very good start to a course, sir. Uh, I hope uh, uh, similarly the registration happens and uh, I am very happy that uh, we have a very excellent team. I would like to thank each and everyone, and particularly the participants who are enthusiastic in uh, listening to the end. Uh, thank, I thank you uh, all, all for watching us very patiently, and I thank you, sir. Thank you again for this uh, excellent opportunity, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. If you want the slides of Dr. Suresh Kumar, Dr. Raghunandan, and myself, once again, you can contact me nine eight four double two triple one seven nine. I'll send all the three speakers slides nine eight four double two triple one seven nine. Okay, sir. You can note down my number. This, and sir, the... uh, you can share with this also, sir, so that we are from CGP group will share with all groups uh, whom uh, yeah. we have already posted, sir. So they can everyone yeah. can look into. It. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.